Welcome to Combat Theory Presents, a weekly podcast about all things martial arts, fight science, and combat sports. I'm your co-host, Sammy Ryan, and our latest episode starts now. What is up, guys? This is Paul, the evil professor. I'm joined by my good friend, Coach Rich Grendel. How's it going, everyone? How's it going indeed? All right. So today we're going to be looking at a very special episode of the podcast. We are talking about all things sparring, and we have actually gone out to the internet, and we've gone to social media and asked you guys to give us all of your questions regarding sparring. And I have uh, taken all of those questions. I've put it on a stack of, um, yes, that's correct, envelopes, because that's the only paper that I could find. Uh, I thought I had cue cards, but I, I did not. And uh, we are going to read them and kind of give our opinions on sparring. I think this is important because uh, sparring is a huge component of what we do. And as I was telling you kind of like off air, um, we don't really talk about sparring etiquette a lot. Um, it's kind of one of those things where it's like we we teach you know, drills and we teach activities and we create games and all this other stuff. And then when it's time to spar, you know, people are saying, okay, like, you know, go 40% or go 50% or go 60%. And I can get into a whole kind of conversation about percentage because mm -hmm. if you weigh 225 pounds of muscle, yeah. your 50% is probably a whole lot different than, you know, if you weigh 115 pounds, what your 50% is. So that's kind of like complicated, but sparring, we're going to talk about sparring today. All right. Do you wanna? Do you wanna? Do you wanna read a question first? Do you want me to read a question? First? Uh, yeah. I'll I'll read the question first. All we'll, right. We'll so have you talk. Pull that run right off the top, and you have to deal with my also terrible handwriting. Oh, it looks way better than mine. Okay. Okay. How do I respond to partners with a chip on their shoulder? I get rounds with guys that hate me for no reason. Ooh, I don't know. Um, so I guess I'll go first on that one. And I should probably tell you that although I read the questions and I wrote the questions down, I didn't want to like spend a lot of time thinking on them. Um, because sometimes when I think too much on stuff, it just gets convoluted. I'm really picky about who I spar with. Mm -hmm. I'm super, super picky about who I spar with. I, um, I'm, you know, I'm older. I'm 40. I'll be 41 this year. I've been, uh, training for a long time and my full-time job is teaching so if I get hurt that could be a big problem mm -hmm. so for me if there's guys in the gym that I spar with that are um, I don't know they're like aggressive or they're acting like they're upset about stuff I'm probably just not going to spar with them anymore um, but I'm also the coach and I'm also <laughs> like you know before that I was a senior student so for a long time I could get away with saying like oh, I'm not sparring with that guy Um if you're a newer student, that's more complicated. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Rich? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, my first thought would be don't spar with that guy. If you've had one experience, okay, maybe give him a second chance. All right, two experiences, goes bad, don't spar with him. Um, but like you said, it does get tricky, especially like if you're kind of forced with that partner. Sure. Um, my advice, because I have training partners still to this day that I – hate sparring for that reason okay um so what i try to do is uh start off like being funny do something silly yeah. kind of like from the get-go create a light make it like yeah. yeah that way they don't think it's like oh this guy's gonna try and get revenge on me so i need to make sure i really give it to him this time if they're that type of person you know crack a joke if you got that kind of charm yeah. you know like i said do something silly like if i'm sparring a guy who's like 60 pounds heavier than me and they fight really intense, I'll start with like a jumping, spinning uppercut. Something just so stupid that they can't help but laugh or not take me serious. Yeah. Hopefully we can keep it at that pace. You know, I'll, something that I... Something I do in jiu-jitsu, I, I, I'm terrible. My jiu-jitsu is terrible. It's always been terrible. I've been doing jiu-jitsu for like... Since 2007, I, I think that I've been a, a like... I give up. I give up. I just don't have the mind space for it. I suck at it. I don't understand. I'm getting it. there. I'm <laughs> like it, it. Just I'm. I'm not. I. I. I think it's a great art. I think it's very practical. I just suck at it. it this is the truth, and I don't want to give it the headspace to get better at it either because of all the other stuff that I do. But um, sometimes when I'm when I'm rolling with someone that's like really aggressive, I'll start asking them like really stupid questions. Yeah. Like, what do you think a used sex doll 
would cost? <laughs> That's a question before that I've actually like said when when I'm like kind of and the guy will like slow down and start to be like what and I'm like yeah so like what what would the cost of that be? Yeah, and they'll start to be like. I mean, I don't, I don't know. And they start asking, and they, and they, they kind of slow down as well. So in a similar way, like sometimes I'll use humor mm-hmm. to kind of defuse and bring the situation down. Yeah, um, I think, I think that comes from, you know, I don't know if you were, but I was bullied for some yeah, time. Of course, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. So you've been beaten up for just being you, like whatever reason. Yeah, hundred. But if you can charm them, if you can say something funny or make it awkward, then you can kind of like get out of that situation without taking a beating. Yeah. Um. And I I feel like that translated to, to that arts. to to again sparring is simulating fighting. So if I want to not get to that level, let me try and diffuse it a little bit. Let me yeah. be a little more playful, more relaxed. And you know, I think also too, we kind I guess we could talk on this for a long time. What is your relationship with someone like when you're drilling with them and you're training with them, right? Because that's I'm a big believer that I don't like guys that just show up for sparring. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I have when I when I have my teams and stuff, I have a process. Even if you, I know you're experienced. I know you fought as an amateur or as a pro. I still will let them go through this process. Again, certain cases they'll go through it faster. Other cases it may be months. But it to me, sparring really comes down to three main things, which is skill development. You got to have the ability to do these things offensively and defensively. Trust. Again, if they're just coming in for sparring, I don't trust you. Yeah. Like immediately like, oh, I didn't see you except for last sparring session and the one before that. I don't trust you. What are your intentions? And then that goes into understanding. So skill development, trust, and understanding, those are the three keys to good sparring. Sure. Um. So those guys who just come in to spar, I don't. I when I ran a team, I didn't. That's yeah. that's not gonna fly. Well, if I don't. If I that's it. That's the thing, right? In drilling, I build trust with you, mm-hmm. and then if you know, if I if I have a good relationship with you in drilling, usually that translates to like we had a guy that um, in clinch sparring last week. He was you know they were clinch sparring, and he, you know, we're allowed to kind of like we open hand smack each other a little bit when clinch sparring because we don't clinch with. Uh, I should say. The majority of the time, we do not clinch bar with gloves on. Sure. And he kind of like, you know, he went to push him with his like closed fist, and he kind of cl- like clipped him a little bit. But they they're trained together a lot. They're friends. They they care about each other. And they were, and the guy was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. And he knew they both knew that their intent was not to hurt each other because they've have they've been training together for right. years and they have built up that level of trust. You know, so I think to me, I would try to figure out why does why do these people hate you. Mm-hmm. Is it you? Is it them? Right? Because if maybe you're being a prick all the time and then you go to sparring, like they're trying to teach you a lesson. Uh, but then the other side of that would be, you know, maybe you need to build more trust with them. Um, maybe you need to like slow the situation down, diffuse it. Um, yeah. All right. Let's go to the let's go to the next question. Um, God, I, now I want to pass. This question is it's uh, I saw your video about tactical resilience. What the heck is that? I guess I should probably go ahead and start. I was going to say, one. I yeah, so, I don't use those two words together. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Tactical resilience, guys. I have a video on YouTube about it. Um, to put briefly, tactical resilience is a term that comes from um, from the military, comes from combat training. And what it is, is that tactical resilience is a part of why we spar. So um, tactical resilience. I'm hurt but I'm not out of the fight. So just because you got hit kind of hard doesn't mean that you can't fight anymore. It just means that it hurt. And I think early on when you're sparring, you've got to learn sometimes that like, um, you know, if I get hit and it hurts, it doesn't mean that I can't keep fighting. Um, and that uh, at, at the basic, that's what tactical resilience is, mm-hmm. is just getting used to being resilient in a tactical sense. Yeah. Um, you know, we've all had the guy that gets kind of touched in the gym and he like, you know, he, he does too much with it, you know, likewise, man, talk to any, any of, uh, the long-term martial artists, long-term athlete stuff hurts. Like, you you know, like my, my left foot has been hurt for a year. Mm -hmm. Like you have to come in and train in spite of the fact that it hurts. And that's, that's what tactical resilience is. And you off air, you kind of said something about that, where when your students get um like hit in the groin, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've 
we were talking about um, just all these little things that could happen in a fight that you just have to deal with. And it may be against the rules. It may be against uh, the code of honor, whatever. But uh, you still have to fight. Yeah. And like you said, like, we all know it hurts. Like, I hate getting kicked. <laughs> I hate it. I hate checking kicks. Yeah, well, that always hurts. I mean, it, but I have to do it. Yeah. If I'm trying to win this game, I have to do that. We call it, uh, you know, the price of victory. Yeah. Sometimes you get hurt more as the winner than the guy who lost. Yeah, there, there's a concept in in uh, Filipino like martial arts. They do a lot of like knife work, blade work, and they have a concept of um. I don't I don't want to mess this up. It's uh, winner drips, loser gushes, mm. and the thought process is if in a knife fight. Both people are getting cut. One's just going to get cut, hopefully, like, a lot less. So like, that's... Like that's, two stabs to, like, five slashes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's what tactical resilience is, is that the ability to, even though you're hurt, you're not out of the fight. Um, and it's something that you have to learn. It's something you have to learn. Just like, you know, when a little kid is running and falls and he starts crying immediately, he he's not hurt. He's just, like, a little shook up. Mm -hmm. You as a fighter, you as an athlete have to learn that, like, hey, man, if I get swept hard... Shake it off, get up, get ready, you know? My favorite, and we could talk about these guys throughout this whole podcast, but the ties. When you watch Thai training, Thai fights, they have the best attitude for that. Yeah. They look like they don't care. They yeah, they just don't care. Uh, he, I head kick you, you drop, whatever. Uh, you catch my kick and sweep me, who cares? Like, they always have this, like... And that's also, I think that's too, a part of your poker face. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you can't, if you're hurt, you can't let the other guy know, like, yeah, hey, that really hurt, man, you know? But, yeah, that's my short version, but we have a longer video. And whoever wrote that question, thank you, by the way, for watching the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I, you might be the only one. Rich, you want to you wanna pull a card? Ooh, weight differences. Yeah, that one was literally just weight differences. <laughs> um, I think we can go anywhere with that one. Yeah, so again, when I, I talked about um, the three keys, understanding, right? That's the third key for me. And understanding, like you said, like, I hate that. I was only going 50%. Yeah. But you're also 210, and they are 140. Uh, the whole thing with weight, really, you should stick to your weight class within one to two pound or one to two classes. Yeah, if you can. If you can. If you but obviously, there's... You know, there's limitations t towards your team or towards your session. So it's not always going to be that perfect game. So understanding that I'm the bigger guy or even understanding I'm the smaller guy because that can go the other way, too. So I, that takes time, right? And trust. Yeah. To be honest with you, I'm less I'm less um, big on on weight differences and I'm a little more focused on on, and there are obviously outliers on height differences, because if I have someone that is five ten on weight, and mm -hmm. I have someone that's five ten and he's thirty pounds overweight, those are probably they probably should be the same weight class. They're just not in theory the same weight class. So I like my people to try to work together and kind of like height, because typically height is going to be like the or at least for me, I start to base kind of weight class decisions based on how tall are you. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a taller guy, you might be able to get away with a, a heavier weight class, you know. Um, again, there, you know, Becco is an outlier where he can make a very um, a great weight for how tall he is. Mm -hmm. But he's a lean guy, you know. Um, but, yeah, you know, uh, we'll talk more about this later because I know there's other, some other questions about weight differences. But you need to be very aware. Yeah. of your of your weight class and and that's for multiple reasons because power obviously is one component but another component of that is is speed because the heavier guys are going to be are going to be throwing slower mm -hmm. and the lighter people are going to be throwing faster typically so if you are a a 145er and you're always training with 185ers they're they're not going to move the same way you know, and you're going to get used to maybe a slower game. Mm -hmm. And then when you go down to fight guys, your weight class, they're going to be moving faster. Likewise, if you're if you're spending all of your time, you know, walking around too heavy and then you cut down to the proper weight, you're going to be like, wow, I'm not like I'm used to being a lot slower mm -hmm. and you can't be slower. You have to be faster in that game. A hundred percent. Yeah. And like I said, like typically the big problem 
when you get small guy versus little guy is the big guy hurts the little guy. But you do see this faster, smaller guy just landing at will. Yeah. You know, he kind of starts clowning on the guy. And you have to be like, again, if it's someone your size, you're not pulling that off. Yeah. Or, you know, some some dude that's really taller, that's bigger, gets, you know, very comfortable using long range tools, which maybe he wouldn't be able to do that when he's competing with someone his size, sure, yeah. you know, his weight, his height. All right. Let's see where that takes us. Ooh, very broad question. What does it mean to be a good training partner? That's what a- does it mean to be a good training partner? I wrote... Okay, what do you got for me? <laughs> I wrote, for me, because I like this question. Okay. Because, I again, I've coached a lot of teams, and I'll get this. Guys will come up to me. I don't know why everyone complains about me. I'm a good partner. Why does everyone hate me, bro? Yeah, and I'm like... Well, let's talk about what is a good partner. Sure. So I, I made a list of what right. I feel. I like that. So someone uh, came prepared. I like, yeah, I like a Rich, little preparation. This is why you're you're back on the on the podcast. <laughs> Come prepared, people, if you want to be on the podcast. It helps. It helps. All right. So the first thing I wrote was uh, able to adjust intentions. So are we going hard today, or are we going light? Is this an MMA? Is this kickboxing? Is this Muay Thai? Someone who can switch the intentions of training around. Sure. That's an immediate good sign for me. Um, they're able to work with a variety of partners. So if you see, like, if I'm coaching a class and I see Paul, you just went with Juan. He's a big, big scary guy. Two forty six four, yeah. And then you go and spar, you know, Gina. Yeah. And you're giving w- good work on both partners. Oh, that guy looks like he might be a good partner to work with. Um, little to no ego. Sure. So, like, again, if you got swept... And you got up very angry. Yeah. I, I don't want to spar with that guy. No. But if you got up like, oh, good job. Keep going. Okay. That guy's got like no ego. He's just here to work. Um. Again, knowing the rule sets. If, yeah. If we're I'm doing. the rules is really yeah, important. Like, yeah. If you're like, all right, guys, we're doing uh, Muay Thai sparring and a guy shoots a double leg. Yeah. I don't want to go with that guy. That's not really the rules, my man. <laughs> um, For me. I have a rule, and I know a lot of gyms do this. I don't allow I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I've either. heard you say it. Yeah, um, stop saying it, please. It's my bad if you want to say something. Yeah. But if you're truly sorry, just don't do that thing again. Yeah. It's like Everyone uses I'm sorry and then goes back to doing what they're doing. It, I, it was an accident. This might be like a life <laughs> lesson because I'm sorry is not mean that what you did can be done again. Right, like, because I think sometimes people, even in relationships, they think that if they just say they're sorry, that it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's this is not. No, this is not how that works. That's not what that word means. Yeah, I, I mean, I learned this the hard way back when I've done, you know, hard training with better guys when I was younger and stuff. I remember one particular incident where I went for an arm bar on a, on a guy who fought in the UFC, and I was real young at the time. And when I went for it, I was spastic, and I need him in the face. Oh yeah. And I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. And he did a flying knee drop to my chest and says, I'm sorry. I died. I was on the mats. Like, you know, when you're so hurt, like you're you, you can't help but laugh because like, <laughs> like oh. whatever your body response is, like you just laugh. That's what happened. So I was like, oh, yeah. Sorry means nothing. Yeah, no, it doesn't mean, that. <laughs> you know, especially when you're working with a pro, because if you hurt a pro. Um, that could be their career. I mean, I swelled his eye up. Yeah, I mean, he might not be able to fight. Right. You know, like, um, we've had guys that are, you know, two weeks out from from their fights, and get hurt, mm-hmm. and that they don't get paid. Um, I know a guy. I know a guy that um, this is kind of on a on a side note, but he he was fighting for a hundred thousand to fight, hundred thousand to win, and he um needed to put together a training camp. And he had fought for that organization multiple times. So he was he told them, he's like, I need money to set up uh, my camp. And he was a good guy. He was reliant. They had been with them for a long time. They gave him $100,000. And then he got hurt in that camp, so he couldn't fight. He was still on the hook for $100,000. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, you know, if you hurt a pro and say, I'm sorry... Like you, you just took money out of their mouth, man. You took money out of their family's mouth. So it's like I, I'm not a huge fan of the word. I'm sorry. Just yeah. be, be better. Yeah. Just do better. And also, like y- newer students, 
sometimes I, like you you have a newer student that like they're trying to throw a jab at you and their jab lands and they'll say I'm sorry. And I'll be like, that that was your intent. Your yeah. intent was to punch me with your jab. This is what we're here for. This is why we're here. <laughs> you don't need to punch me. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, no, no, you're not. Like, you're, you're you're paying to punch me in the face. Like, there's nothing for me. There's nothing more painful than that student his first week or two of sparring because he's gonna say it so much and yeah. he's gonna say I'm sorry for saying I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it becomes this like paradox. No, I'm just, and you're just immediately, like immediately the first time I hear it, I'm like, listen, we yeah. don't we don't say that. No S word. You know, if something bad happens. Let's slow it down, talk about it, but we're not going to just completely say I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So those are good partners. Strive for those things, people. The the the, uh, the two points that I would I kind of would add to that was like the first one where you said like being able to do a lot of different things. To me, I look at that as like a costume. One of the things that I think makes you in in invaluable in a gym is if I can show you a fighter. And I can say, hey, can you emulate that person? I need you to be that person because our fighter is going to fight that person in, in six weeks. And I need someone that can act like that. So if you can wear the costume of fighter of, of another fighter, that's super valuable. Yeah. Sometimes we see guys in the gym that um, or we see guys in fighting that like in the UFC or higher level fighting where they come in and they have a very unique style. And for a long time, it's hard to beat them because we can't get someone in the gym to emulate them. And if you can't get someone in the gym to emulate them, it's hard to drill and, and you know, spar because they, they don't see any of that stuff until they're in the, the cage with them. And the other thing that I would say is that if you want to be an invaluable training partner, learn to feed mitts really, really well. Because if you learn to feed mitts really, really well, every training camp will want you there. Every, every coach will love you. Um, you will... You become someone that like, oh, you know, I know Robert can feed mitts, so let's get Robert here and let's get this guy here and all this other stuff. Um, so those are two of the things that I would say on top of all of your things, which I think are very true. And yeah. shower, please. <laughs> yeah, just in general, be a good person. I think really what it comes down to is the golden rule. Treat others how you want to be treated, sure. right? So like if you can just stick to that. You don't you don't have to know every rule set and all that. That's that's great. Like you said, it's super invaluable. But if you're just you know, I I I don't want to have bad rounds. I don't want to like not do good for this person. Well, then learn how to be good, yeah. and then you can you can do that trade off. Don't be a prick. Don't be a prick. Yeah. All right. Pull oh, a card, re- my friend. What is it? I have to read it first, and then I'll say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Don't worry about it. Cause <laughs> so I... how do you figure out what types of people are good training partners for you? Oh, man, two in a row. Um, well, that was weird. That I Listen, I did shuffle. I wanted to be known that I did shuffle <laughs> these cards. Um, drilling, drilling with people, you know, drilling over and over again, seeing what, um, hey, when I drill with this guy, he gives me energy. I think, you know, I did um, kung fu for a while when I was younger. And I think that the thing that I learned from Kung Fu, to be very honest with you, was energy is that, you know, for you to do the technique that you want, your partner has to give you the energy for that technique. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the one I always go to in Muay Thai is if we're working on um, like inside sweep, outside sweep or something where I'm like doing off balancements. If my partner's not giving me the, the, the position or the stance that I need to work on that, then I can't do it. And it's like, that's the hardest thing when you're working on sweeps, for example, when I'm like, okay, guys, I'm gonna do this sweep. You got to get the weight off this leg. And then what are they going to do? Like, everyone's going to put all their weight on that leg because they don't want to get swept. You know, Mm -hmm. subconsciously, they're like, well, let me just weigh this lay down. And then everyone's like, well, I can't figure it out. Right. It's like, well, yeah, because your partner's not giving you the good, the energy that you need to do that. Mm -hmm. And you could probably get away with it, but you just have to ramp up your intensity high, so high that when you do it, it's going to hurt the other guy. So... I would say that ultimately time in class, training, finding partners. Um, I say this a lot in my class. You know, um, I would rather train with someone that shows up five days a week than someone that shows up one time a week. That's that's really good because the guy that shows up five times a week is eventually going to become hopefully a much better training partner for me. And I built a relationship with him. But yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts. Um, yeah, I I 100% agree. Like you said, 
two things, uh, drilling and come to class. And in my process of like, oh, you're a new student here. Oh, when sparring? First off, when they ask that question, I already know the <laughs> type of person they are. Trouble. Well, what days do we spar? I'm like, all right. <sighs> come to class. Show up. I Again, I don't care your skill level. You're a 5-0 and o amateur, 5-0 and o pro, whatever. Come to our classes. Exactly like you said, get to know the students, the coaches, the energy. You have to, like, if I just sparred you, not knowing you at all, just going off a of physical appearance, first impression, I have no clue how intense you're able to go, what's your skill level. Yeah. Um, you may be the most badass guy I've ever met, but I might treat you like some schmuck and then get dropped for it. Or the opposite. Yeah. I might think, you're. oh, you've been training for 20 years? You must be amazing. And then I give it my all and I hurt you. Like, I... I, I have this conversation with my students regularly where I'll be like, um, if someone, if you go into a new gym and they ask you like how long you've been training, I always say, oh, I, I've, I've been training for like a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, have you, have you trained Muay Thai? Yeah, yeah, I've trained a little bit. You know what I mean? I hate when people come in and they start giving you their like accomplishments. <laughs> like, oh, I, I, um, I, I'm, you know, I've got 38 fights. Like, dude, like half the time when people come in and say all that stuff, they're terrible. Right. Like it's all, it's all bullshit. Um, but you know, yeah, I think that you have to build a relationship with people in drilling in, in class and then, and also like in the extracurriculars. So if your gym goes and does, you know, if, if, if all of your team goes into a fight and they all go watch fights, like we, last couple months ago, we all went to fight. We do like a beach workout every quarter where we basically go for a run and we do, um, exercises on the beach and then we do drills on the beach. Those things I do for fellowship, you know, because like really, we could, you we could watch. You know, I could say, "Hey guys, watch Muay Thai on, on YouTube or whatever." Mm-hmm. You know, to watch some fights. But when we go to these events and we do all these extracurriculars, I think that they build fellowship and they build community and they build a team. And I think those are the things that like, who are the people that always go to those things? You know, those are the people that are actually they actually care about the sport and they care about training and they want to be a part of the team. Those are ultimately the people that, for me, um you know, are great training partners and build relationships with them outside of the gym. You know, if you see a cool video on Instagram, send it to them. If you, you know, if you like our podcast, share it, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are the things that I think are like, I have built relationships with training partners that I've had now for 20 years and I don't live, I don't live around them anymore, but they still message me. They still send me stuff. Oh my Mm -hmm. God, this is so cool. What do you think of this? You know, they'll, they'll come up and visit, come to the gym or if I'm in their town, I go to their gym. Um, That is one of the cool things about what we do is that you can build really awesome relationships. Now, there are people that do the opposite of that, that kind of just burn bridges everywhere they go. Uh, but, you know, I think it's it's uh, it's like a relationship, man. You know, a good training partner, someone that you're, you know, they're your friend, you've had a relationship with them for hopefully a long time. Mm-hmm. But... Even if it's a short time. Yeah, you, I mean, it's intense. I feel like most people have a good gauge on, like, if they like someone or not. And yeah. When it comes to... A, training martial arts whether it's Muay Thai whatever are you getting better with this person yeah are you getting through the workout is it is it competitive is it is it you know productive well then that's probably a good training are they adding stuff to it you know like maybe you didn't get a part of the technique but they did Mm -hmm. and then when you go back and drill it's like you're both you know you're both adding pieces in all right what do I got here oh okay um this is from a coach and he said how often should my team spar that's a complex question. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, so again, uh, it all comes down to uh, understanding. Like, what are the goals? Like, I know a lot of teams do, like, a like a weekly sparring class, right? Sure. And that's just, like, in general, that's most teams. They have, like, today is our Muay Thai sparring. Um, if you got a guy who's fighting soon or a couple guys fighting soon, then maybe... You know, the you feel it's necessary to ramp it up to where they need two or maybe even three sessions in a week, and you're picking which days are like hard sparring or technical sparring. If they feel, if you feel they need that kind of amount of sparring, um, I know a lot of athletes these days kind of go off on their own and they spar with other teams. You know, sure, outside of their main team. So again, it comes down to understanding that that athlete those athletes they need to have that relationship with the coach and if the coach feels hey i only need you guys sparring twice a week 
you're going to do our team sparring and we'll do a private session. Okay, if you feel that's necessary. If you don't, hey, guys, you can get away with just class sparring. Yeah. Um, hmm. And then there's the the new favorite everyone's... I don't spar anymore. I don't spar anymore. Yeah, I don't need to spar. I don't need to spar. Hey, and you know what? Maybe if you have, you know, maybe maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Again, understanding. <sighs> everyone's different. I I like my, gar- my guys to um we have sparring on fridays um we used to have sparring on thursdays but when you guys you guys used to have sparring on fridays Mm -hmm. and um i decided that we would move our sparring to fridays maybe this year um because i i couldn't get people to come in on fridays to be honest with you so i brought i i made sparring an hour earlier so we do sparring at six on fridays and i told everyone i was like look i promise you if you come in at six i'll have you out of here by 659 We'll get our sparring rounds in and we'll get out of here. You can go out and do all the fun stuff you want to do on Friday night. And then I have more time to teach throughout the week because essentially what was happening is I was teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We were sparring on Fri- on Thursday and then no one would show up on Friday. And it, it has helped a lot putting sparring on Friday night. Um, I didn't want to have, I don't want to teach on Friday nights, to be honest with you. Like everyone else, I want to go out and do, you know, well, really, I don't want to go out. I want to sit at home, watch TV, but um we started sparring on friday nights so we spar on friday nights we clinch spar another day of the week typically Mm -hmm. um but in clinch sparring it's in my gym we take very little damage we're very technical about our clinch sparring we typically are clinch sparring without gloves and without shin guards and we're just really tech sparring clinch um one time a quarter we do um as a as a team we do hard sparring where like we'll just kind of tell everyone like we do we have a cage in our building or we have a and we have a ring in our building um and we will um basically do matchups and we'll do simulated three round fights we and, and we'll make someone referee we'll make two of the students corner we'll do like the whole experience um, just as a, as a, like a way to build some, like a, some stress inoculation and that is hard sparring. So we typically do that one time every quarter, but that is my class structure, right? How often should you spar? Um, I think that you really need to limit the amount of damage that you take. And for me, I don't really like my students or even my athletes to spar more than one time a week, full contact. I like my guys to clinch spar an additional day a week, but it depends on the athlete. It depends on the camp. It depends on what your goal and purpose is. I don't like my guys to go other places and spar, but some people don't mind that. Or if you have a good relationship where you know the coach at the other gym, um, but I like to be able to watch my guys in their sparring rounds. Um, but it's it's over and over and over again when I talk to <clears throat> excuse me when I talk to <clears throat> when I talk to uh, former athletes, retired athletes, high level competitors, they will always say, "I wish I would have sparred less," mm-hmm. or "I felt like I sparred too much." So we're trying to figure that out. The problem is, is that from a scientific standpoint, we don't really have a lot of information on what the ideal amount of sparring is. And then you got like the Max Holloway's that talk about how they don't spar anymore. But you know, how, how, what, how intense is is their drilling? Mm -hmm. You know, um, we use a concept called freelance drilling where although you're doing a drill, you can freelance other things in where you can like, Hey, maybe you maybe we're working on like jab cross back and forth, but then every once in a while the other guy throws jab cross and maybe he throws a kick or whatever. But again, you have the good relationship with your training partner mm-hmm. to get away with that. Ah, but you know, I've also in my life I've trained in gyms where we sparred four times a week. I've trained in gyms where we kind of sparred every day. Um I I think that you need to limit the amount of sparring to especially for just everyday students to one time a week. Um, yeah. I mean, I go as far as I spar once a month, once every two months, me personally, as you were saying, you know, you get older, you deal with injuries or you're coaching, you need to watch. Yeah. Like again, having an understanding of your role. Um, if you're a fighter, 
you know, that once a week sparring is probably a little more mandatory. Yeah, for sure. To just keep you sharp with your, your reflexes and testing the skills that you trained hard all week. Um, but yeah, guys who are open matters, they're sparring three or four times sure. you know, or their gym just Jumping happens around. to spar all the yeah. time. Um, that's, I don't, I don't think that's helpful. Again, I come from a time where a majority of training was sparring. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to warm up with low kicks and spar. And that was Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I also was in a gym for a while where they decided that they were only going to spar one time a month. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think it was actually more problems than it was like, cause they were, they were having a lot of issues and their solution was like, Hey, we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're just gonna spar one time a month. I think originally it was two times a month, and then they were still having problems. And like we're gonna spar one time a month. It didn't solve the problems. What the, they had cultural problems where they needed to like redefine what sparring was because mm-hmm. sparring was not like like let's it was not fighting. It was sparring, and their solution was to start trying to take it out to try to fix the problem. But they really needed to have an an honest conversation about what sparring was. Because what was happening is, is that people were sparring one time a month and they were just getting all messed up. Yeah. And they just wouldn't come back. If, if Again, like, that's me. I'm once a month. Yeah. But I'm always but holding pads. I'm always training. a really long time. Right. And you're not a competitor anymore. And here's the truth. Like, I sparred yesterday and I was shit. <laughs> like, I was not good. My t- Because I've been, I've been playing the role of my yeah. students' opponents lately. So all my training is me getting beat up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't and have you accept kicks. Yeah, you accept I, things. Yeah. My defense was on point, but my offense was pretty trash. No, same way, man. Like I, um, I, I sparred like last week with a couple of my students for like the first time in a really long time, and um, I was too willing to let them like hit me because I, in drilling, when I'm feeding mitts or when I'm doing whatever. Sometimes I'll be like, okay, cool. We're going to do like, you know, like yesterday I have a shorter fighter and I was like saying like, um, Hey, we're going to do, um, like, I forget what the drill was, but I was, Oh, it was like uppercut rear uppercut lead hook and then cross. And I was having them put the cross on my body because they're shorter than I was. So it was just faster for me to be like, yeah, I just punch my body. And there's, they're a smaller weight class. So it wasn't really hurting me. Um, yeah, because as a coach, you get very, very willing to, you know, kind of be like, oh, yeah, kick my leg. Okay, cool. Da, 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 da. And then in, in sparring or fighting, like, I should be checking these things. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you you know, you're developing bad habits. Yeah, I, I, I joke about this thing called um, IFD, International Feeders Disease, where we start to, if you feed a lot, you know, as a coach, you start to develop really bad habits sometimes. Because mm-hmm. although you should feed the way you fight, if you know, I'm there's days that I'm doing six hours of feeding a day, you know, and I do like four round, like four minute, ten, 10 rounds of four minutes feeding sometimes for four or five hours. Like I, I, you know, I drop my hands and I'm like, you know, not really worried about myself because I'm trying to build this fighter to be mm-hmm. a great fighter or well, too, like emulating opponents. Like, yeah. Like if I have a very specific opponent that I know about. Oh, he drops his right hand. I'm going to emulate his mistakes. Exactly. And what that's going to do is to some extent that's going to make me start have to have those mistakes. mistakes. Even though you know better, knowing's yeah. not enough. You got to drill. You got to drill. You, yeah. you, you are, I say this all the time, small mistakes in training become devastating failures in fighting. I'll say that again. Small mistakes in training, devastating failures in fighting. Mm-hmm. And like if you're emulating mistakes as a coach sometimes you're going to be you know or as a feeder that could be problematic yeah all right rich pull a card my friend what do you got for me we got (laughs) this is where you're going to discover that most martial artists are poor readers (laughs) i'm i'm just a poor speaker i got to do everything in my head first yeah fair fair all right so how do you feel about sparring drills such as shark tanking okay first off i think that there's a couple of different definitions for shark tanking sure so what I define as shark tanking is one fighter stays in the um, in the round and they're getting fresh training partners, whether that's a fresh training partner every round or sometimes like we would MMA shark tank where they might get three or four different fresh partners in a, a five-minute round or something. Mm-hmm. 
Is is that how you see Shark Tank? Yeah, well? that's how I use it, and a okay. lot of gyms I've I've been with have used it. Th- there's other things too, like you get a fresh partner every round. Sure. Um, you know, maybe you're changing what you're doing each round, like up downs or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, I've seen this in Jiu Jitsu too, where it's like, you know, the one guy stays on the ground and then just keep getting someone new mm-hmm. on top constantly. Um, so I think it's, I think it 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 has a purpose in the gym. Um. I for me the purpose is to um is kind of to beat up the person that that's staying in there to some extent and I think maybe less physically and more mentally is what I'm saying beat up wise I think it goes both ways yeah physically and mentally because essentially it, let's say we're doing the what I would call the the common one which is for MMA one guy in the middle, he's got three or four partners he's switching with. One guy's grappling on the cage, one's on the ground, one's holding mitts, you know, et cetera. Yeah. You're fighting four people. Yeah. If you're fighting one guy, if you just have one drilling partner, then his energy levels are gonna kinda match your yeah. energy levels. You're if you're in better tired. shape he's tired, yes. Yeah, if he if you're in better shape, you're gonna crush him in a round. Sure. So you use those three or four guys to kinda really make it harder than the actual fight. Yes. And if you can, as a fighter, if you can mentally and physically get through that and even come out on the winning side, because a lot of times it's not intended to win. I, I'll use it as a worst case scenario. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it does help build a lot of confidence. Confidence, to the fighter. character. Mm-hmm. Character is a big yeah. one. I, sometimes what we'll do is we'll do, um, we'll do five rounds of kickboxing and the one guy will stay um, in the ring and every round he'll have a fresh person and it's kind of the same idea you're getting tired they're not and it, you have to you have to go in spite of mm-hmm. the fact that you you know that and it's worst case scenario training yeah because i think one of the biggest fears that fighters have is i'm gonna get tired and he's not gonna be tired so we're just facing that fear head on and saying like hey man even though you're tired it doesn't mean that you can't still work right um and and also it's a tool where if you have an athlete that's way above the other athletes, he's more athletic, you can kind of, like, negate that by making him stay and other partners are coming in. A lot of times we, as coaches, will will say it because we know it to be true, but, like, the fight is won before the fight. Sure. And there's certain moments in training where you, as a coach, will see your athlete perform in a way and you go, wow, there, I have no doubt now that they're going to perform at their best, yeah, or or the and shark opposite tanks, of that. Yeah, yeah, or the opposite. And yeah. shark tanks will point that out. They can be great on their solo mitt rounds. They could be great with their drilling rounds with their partners. But you put them in a shark tank, and they do poor. Well, we got to change a couple of things. We got to do some new drilling to build that confidence. Uh, then we'll come back to a shark tank and let's see what's different. And that, and that goes back to you know perseverance. Mm-hmm. You know, are they able to push through regardless? Um, so I think it's valuable. I, I don't think that it's something that you're going to do often. Um, for me, we, we might do that one time or two times in a 10-week camp. Yeah. It's not, I don't think it's something that you need to be doing every single week. Yeah, if it's if the first one is successful in your eyes, yeah. why, what's why the point do of doing a one? second yeah. one and then it fails and then now you're like, shit, well, now we got to do a third. The, yeah, <laughs> the model that, that we use typically is that I think three weeks out, we'll Shark Tank, our, our athlete, and ho- we're ho- we're hoping that that goes really really well. And that's a good time to see signs of peaking. Yeah, you they might not be fully peaked. Maybe that's the session that you see the first signs of peaking, or they nailed it, you got it, or it went real bad. Well, now we have time to yeah. make adjustments and really build those skills. Not much, but you have some, enough. You know, enough. you have enough. Yeah. A lot of times you have enough. I will say that that often in. Something I say often, and I know there's not a question on this, but when you have a fighter going to camp, my hope is is that they have all of the skills that they need to win whatever our strategy is going to be. We're just trying to sharpen that. Um, and I think shark tanking is one of those things where it's like I'm, I'm, I have to believe that my fighter has all of the the mental fortitude that he needs prior to the start of the camp. But through the camp, a big part of this, my um, one of my friends Juan Brea says this. You are confidence building throughout your camp. You're building the confidence that the strategy that we have developed that you can execute at it 100. 
Um, and that's why it's when I get I get really hot on my guys when they start missing camp days. Because I'm like, look, this is not like if, you know, outside of camp and you're missing days, we can talk about it. But inside of camp, if you're missing days, it's unacceptable. You know. All right. All right. Let me see. Long reach here. Um, okay. Uh, this is a, a question. Interesting. Is it okay to throw elbows in heavy cage or ring sparring? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what, again, what are the rules? Yeah, ex- exactly. The understanding, uh, again, trust, and do you actually have skill to throw elbows? Generally speaking, if we're throwing elbows in the gym, we have elbow pads on. Sure. So, have I drilled with elbow pads? Have I? Can I actually elbow and land with the pad? Cause, Am I wearing elbow pads right now? <laughs> right. Yeah. Did coach say we're allowed we're to? We're throwing elbows. Yeah. Uh, Am I going with a guy I can trust to, if I hit him with elbows, he's not going to freak out? Or, again, if he hits me with an elbow, and is he going to hit it with the pad? Because this is something I, again, uh, those pads move. Yeah. So, it's supposed to be on your elbow joint. Will you throw one or two elbows, or you block a couple kicks, it slides to the yes. forearm. But if you aim the elbow with the joint, you're not hitting the pad at all. Are you forearm bashing or are you elbow striking? Yeah, and you have to have that trust to where is my partner going to actually kill me with the elbow? Are you drilling elbows in class um, or is this guy just an idiot? Um, Man, there's so much to unpack there. First off, Mm -hmm. um, rules of engagement. You know, whenever we do sparring at the gym, um, I always go over the rules really quickly. And what I usually, you know, to how in depth that is might not be that in depth at all. Like, for example, the vast majority of my guys understand what modified Muay Thai means. Hey, guys, we're doing modified Muay Thai rules. No elbows. Um, you know, you can knee to the body. You can't knee to the head. Uh, all right, let's go. You know, like that, that might be the synopsis, right? If I have people that everyone was here the last five weeks of sparring, mm-hmm. week six of sparring, I'm not going to re- explain the rules elbows are complicated because first off elbows for those that don't know elbows are a cutting tool they're designed to cut they're designed to cut the eyebrows the nose the cheeks that that's the kind of the point of the elbows i'm using it to cut the other person so typically in sparring we're going to hopefully be wearing elbow pads if we're if we're drilling elbow sparring so if we're doing full rules muay thai um so that's one uh, two, so, you know, do I trust my my partner that if their elbow pad comes off, they're going to adjust it and they're going to fix it? Because, you know, even we've seen in, in, you know, full rules Muay Thai amateur fighting in Florida where the guy's elbow pad has come down and he doesn't, like, stop to say, like, hey, this is covering my forearm, not my elbow anymore. Um, he And he may not be aware sure. of it, so I'm not saying that it's it's intentional. Um what are the rules? You know, if, if you are, you know, in a modified Muay Thai round and the guy starts throwing elbows on you, then no, that's that would not be cool. Mm-hmm. But if the understanding is is that we're we're sparring full rules Muay Thai, then yeah, I guess it's fine to throw elbows. But my other question would be if you're doing that in your gym, everyone needs to be wearing elbow pads. So if you if you're sparring full rules and you guys aren't wearing elbow pads, <sighs> That, that's there's that's questionable yeah don't do that you know what i mean like, yeah i'm i'm a hundred percent on I, that i would not <laughs> be about that but then again i'm sure there's some idiot coach out there that would tell you for some reason why that they spar full rules without elbow pads on their on their elbows you know i don't know and maybe i'm i'm wrong to say they're an idiot because maybe they're right maybe i'm wrong <laughs> i mean i have i've told you this before one of my things that i do especially with new guys i know this is frowned upon by a lot of coaches but like i have my guys learn how to uh shadow spar yeah, as we call we it that but like like i know a lot of guys shadow sparring is no contact at all mm-hmm. and that's good too um and that's part of it but like making contact but with no gear on so bare knuckle bare elbow bare knee bare shin the intention is to be so controlled you can land with your weapons without doing any damage whatsoever yeah the rule is if you don't think you can land without doing damage, don't land. So then it's more like shadow to where it's like, sure, I maybe I throw an elbow, but I'm literally this distance away. I'm not 
I'm not coming close and having an accident because I don't believe in accidents in the gym. No, I think I told you this before that I. <laughs> so, Burton Richardson in in Hawaii, he does like open hand sparring mm-hmm. where he touches like the top of the head or the shoulder, and uh, I did I trained um uh, with uh, the Shevchenkos and they do the same thing. They mm-hmm. like they open hand spar. Um, and I tried to institute it at my gym and it was a disaster because people were catching like a uh, finger. They were hurting their fingers and their eyeballs. So it was like fingers and eyeballs that got devastated. I, I was waiting cause I was like, there might be an opportunity to tell a story, oh, but a very similar. Please go ahead. I have done this oh, for man. years. Uh, I picked it up from a guy in Vegas. Yeah, and it, he would we would do it with the kids. No problems. No problems <laughs> no for problems. years. And then I'm covering a guy's boxing class, and there's literally like three students in class, huh? and the the these guys have been boxing for years. So I'm like, all right, guys, we're gonna do a little playful game, and they took it so serious, and a guy's eyelid got split open. Oh my god! And it was just one of those things. Like you have been boxing for almost a decade. <sighs> Why are you trying to beat this old man in a <laughs> in a glorified slap boxing game? Like not even a like it's not even true slap boxing. Oh. So that was the last incident. And <laughs> yeah. then I go, okay, we're just only sticking to shadow sparring and only guys I train. I will not run these games with other people. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, as um same, same deal, man. I I think that it's I I think that you're right though because like Ideally, before people are able to full full gear spar, they should be able to like shout a spar or touch the top of the head or touch the shoulder without without hurting the guy. And I I can do that with my higher level students. Like I could do that. I I like I have a handful of students I would feel totally comfortable with playing that game right now, mm-hmm. no problems. Um, and I thought that i i emulated someone else's model where they were doing it and they were getting away with it and i was like oh this is cool and it was just it it i think it lasted maybe three weeks yeah I, for me i think it is just like anything else it's a process you have to implement small amounts and then over time you can do it more and more yeah. and well, that's kind of again like how i would run my programs where you got to come to class you got to make it to where i invite you to our sparring drills classes and then okay short time there you understand what the drills are so depending on what style of sparring we're doing you can adapt i think that you um i think that you talked about this before where you you have your students do like a lot of trust like trust exercises yeah monday the way i i do it more recent times is monday is trust day a lot of the drills we're doing are just kind of like a reminder of what we've practiced in the past, but we do it in such a way where you're building trust. That way, throughout the week, we already have this understanding of... Can you give me an idea of what, what that would look like? What a, yeah. What a trust drill might look like? So, uh, I have this drill we call the statue drill, okay. which I literally stand there in my stance. Uh-huh. I do nothing. And the guy across from me, he can use his hand controls. So, like, he can pose, he can push on me. We'll do that for a round each. All right, now I can add low kicks. So I can pose, I can push, I can redirect, and I can kick you in the legs. And you're not checking or anything. not. Che- yeah. You're just a statue. You just take it. You're you're yeah. So you're getting used to the contact a little bit. Yeah. And, and then my partner who's kicking me is getting used to hitting troll. with the shin and yeah. not flicking with the foot or kicking in the nuts. <laughs> They're very controlled. And then we add okay, let's say knees to the body. Okay, we can show the elbow. We're not touching with the elbow. You can just show it. Yeah. Just show. And then the other guy, he's getting reps with his eyes. Yeah. And then we could just build from there and we'll get into some more like specific drilling. But Monday ideally is like, let's build some trust today. So throughout the week. By Friday we we trust each other well or yeah. hopefully better. Um you know what's interesting? I think that um when I first started training, it was really hard to get shin guards. Like you didn't get really it was hard to get very good quality shin guards. Mm-hmm. So when we first started training like Muay Thai um, we didn't really train with shin guards, so you would have to learn how to like very safely kick, because you couldn't connect. You had to really make sure that you were connecting like your bone onto their soft tissue, and you had to connect with enough, um, you know, with enough power that it connected, but not enough power to like hurt the other person because you guys are both drilling back and forth. And then when you were working on like shin checking, you had to be very like careful with each other. Mm-hmm. 
now because it's it's super easy for everyone to have shin guards we don't really do stuff like that much anymore and because we don't do stuff like that much anymore i think that like people don't have as much awareness of like what part of their foot or leg is kicking with yeah or like how much power they're putting in because they have this big foam pad and don't get me wrong i i day one i kind of make all my guys that are drilling wear shin guards because i i'm you know i don't want from a liability standpoint yeah 100 percent. i i'm you know <laughs> the last gym i taught at <laughs> Uh, there was two head coaches. We'll call them that. Uh, sure. It was myself and another gentleman. And the joke was he's the Cobra Kai instructor and I'm the Miyagi-Do instructor. Because I'm like always yeah. safety first, guys. Safety first. Let's not hurt each other. Yeah. But if you know my fighters, they're very violent. Yeah. They're absolutely violent killers. But we get that way because we can build trust to where we can do very violent things to yeah. one another without getting hurt. And if someone gets hurt in training... That's bad for everyone. everyone. Like if you're hurting your training partners, if you're hurting your training partners, you're not gonna have training partners anymore. Like, but you're right because there's a weird thing there where like you have to turn on that switch when it's time to fight. Because mm-hmm. when it's time to fight, I have to hurt the guy. You know, it's the hurt game. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I I love my fighters. If you invest time in me and I invest time in you, the last thing I want to see is you gashed, yeah. swelling. Yeah. You know, no broken bones. Like I'm very like. You're my homie. I don't want to see you hurt. That means we have to do a lot of damage to this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And not take damage back. And not take damage. I don't like trading. No. Like I said last time I was here, no fight of the night. Yeah. 100% dominate. Yeah. That's the goal. All right, Rich. You got to your turn, my friend. We're moving through this stack now. Yeah, we're we're cooking, dude. We're cooking. We're only like 45 hours in. (laughs) All right, so this is a good one. Uh, how to best emulate the intensity of a fight in sparring without all of the damage? <sighs> Miley Cyrus. I listen to a lot of Miley Cyrus music during sparring. I think that um, Miley that Cyrus is the un- unsung hero of sparring, and I think she emulates all of the damage and intensity that we need without taking any of the damage. Um, <laughs> God, someone at home. I, I don't know if you're right Cyrus or wrong because sure. I don't listen to Miley. And Miley is just. Whew. I got homework to God, do. Ah, man, I love me some Miley Cyrus. That's probably weird, but I really do. Um, uh, how do I best emulate the intensity of a fight in sparring? Um, there's a lot of ways. The The number one way that most just combat athletes emulate intensity is through exhaustion, where we do stuff that we try to make you really, really tired, and then um, we have you do complicated uh, activities or like spar or whatever, or we have you do a bunch of, you know, a bunch of push ups and then you spar or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know that that it, it really does the job the way that it should. Um, I do a lot of things at my gym. One of the things that we do is sometimes when we're drilling or sometimes we're sparring, I will turn the lights down really, really low so that it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, you can still see your eyes adjust, you can still see what's going on, but it's not ideal lighting conditions. Um, likewise, sometimes I, you know, I've been thinking lately about buying two very, very bright lights and putting them on either side of a small square so that when you're fighting, you're looking into a bright light sometimes, um, just so that it kind of gives you like a a different feeling or a different intensity. Um, you know, we have a shared friend, Johnny Davis, who he likes to, he, he does, you know, um, the P, he created this PKB format where he has um, lights on either side and he feels like the lights change the environment mm-hmm. and make it makes it a different experience. And I kind of agree with him because it does look very different when you watch a PKB event than, you know, training at the gym or whatever. Um, so for me, you know, you've got to figure out ways to create stress, whether that is through changing the lighting, making it very, very loud you know, sometimes you see in um, in jiu-jitsu schools where t- they'll do like a thing where everyone's surrounded in a circle and two mm-hmm. guys are drilling or sparring and everyone's screaming and yelling stuff. Um, we do that sometimes as well where we'll have the guys fighting in the ring and we create this game at our gym where um, when we do hard sparring, we'll do like hard sparring rounds where it's just two guys or two girls or whatever and everyone else around the cage is yelling stuff. Um, the rule is they're not allowed to coach. They're not allowed to. They're, you know, mm. they're, we, we they're not allowed to give any coaching advice. So what we'll do is we'll have the, we'll have two corners, and the corners are going to give advice. Everyone else is not allowed to give advice. They're in fact instructed to give bad advice or say funny things, 
and we'll do a prize each round or each fight for the guy that said the funniest. The best heckler. Yeah, the best heckler, <laughs> right? Because sometimes when you're fighting, people are screaming really ridiculous Not things. sometimes. You know, Not like, sometimes. Like you, Every I, time you fight. I will hear things sometimes cornering that I'm like, what? And also, I'm going to tell you another thing, too. <sighs> this is going to sound kind of effed up, but I will sometimes talk shit to the other guy fighting. Well... Like in a in a very polite right. There's a kind tacti- of tactical tac- way, yeah. and sometimes that breaks the other guy. Mm-hmm. And I'll give I, you. I've an, used that same yes, tactic. It I will great. give you an example. Um, in a previous fight, my guy was um was winning, and the other guy was kind of evading. And I wanted my I wanted the guy to stop evading. I wanted the guy to kind of stand his ground so my guy could finish the fight. So I started kind of saying like, um, it started off with like you know he doesn't want to, <laughs> he mm-hmm. doesn't want to fight you anymore. He doesn't want to fight you. He's leaving. He doesn't want to fight you anymore. And then I started calling the guy by his name and saying, you know, hey so and so, why don't you stay and fight my stay and fight? You're like you got to stay and fight, man. And um, I, listen, I'm playing mental games, mm-hmm. so. Um, likewise, in the, the last fight, I can show you the, the video if you if you guys want if you guys want to comment and I'll I'll send you the video privately probably. But um, my guy w- was in clinch and he was he was getting the better of the other guy in clinch. And at one point, I yelled to the guy. I said, um, "Hey, my guy's way too strong for you in clinch. You don't want to be there with him." And the guy, when they broke, instead of the guy re-engaging my fighter, he turned and started to try to talk shit to me, the corner. Mm-hmm. Well, my fighter's still trying to hit him, so uh, I win. You know what I mean? Like that—that's a win for us, right? So we want to build our fighters that they that they're inoculated from all of that stress, and and that's kind of one of the ways that we emulate that intensity. Um, kind of a funny story. I have a guy that's a triathlete. He's actually running Ironman triathlon, which is like a marathon, a huge swim, something I'll never do it, it, craziness. Right. And he ran a triathlon. And then the next kind of thing he did, maybe three, four months later was he fought a Muay Thai fight, amateur Muay Thai. So, uh, three, two minute rounds. So six minutes and about 30 minutes after he, he fought, he fought, he lost the decision, but it was a good fight. It was close. He uh, was like, man, I was so tired in there. Like, how do I, you know, I need to work on my cardio. And I'm like, yo, dude, you just, you just ran a triathlon like three months ago. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, are you tired right now? It's, it's been about 30 minutes since your fight. And he's like, oh, no. I'm like, could you go for a run right now? He goes, oh, yeah, 100%. I was like, you know, 30 minutes after your triathlon, could you have gone for a run? He's like, no, I, w- I went to the hospital. Yeah. And I was like, uh, okay, so you weren't tired. What happened was is that your central nervous system couldn't process all the data. And because of that, you felt fatigue and adrenaline dump and all this other stuff. So it's not like often fighters are talking to me about how they can fix their cardio. Mm-hmm. And these guys are, are athletic. Like it's not that they have a cardio problem. It's that they have a stress inoculation problem. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I say the same thing when guys ask about running and what – Again, I'm not a track and field coach. I'm not the guy to come to. But uh, if if you're fighting, your coach has a belief that you can make it through the fight. If not, obviously they think you can win the fight. So cardio is usually not an option at that, or not a not an issue at that point. If Shouldn't I go, no. hey, I think you should fight on this card coming up. What do you think? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, cool. I'm not going to, hey, what's your cardio like? Because I see it in the gym. Nine times out of ten, it's not your cardio that got you the loss the problem, when you yeah. got tired. Um, everyone gets tired. I was just talking to this yesterday with a, a student. Uh, she's getting ready for the Point Muay Thai event, and she, you know, great skill, just never competed before. Sure. So there was a time, it was her last round, literally last ten seconds, and I'm like, go forward, go forward, just trust me, go forward, just doesn't matter the combo, go forward. And it looked like crap, just bad technique. But I told her, I'm like, look, if you hadn't done that, you might have lost that round. And yeah. it looks bad. It's ugly. And you're going to be embarrassed when you see it on camera. But it's what won you the round. Yeah. You have to do it. Again, it goes to that tactical resiliency. You have to do it. Do you want to win? Well, I don't care what you look like. I don't care how you feel. 
you have to do it. You know, Jack Dempsey said a champion gets up when he can't. And I think that's and I think that sounds kind of silly, but that is the truth. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have the mental fortitude. Um kind of a note on running that I think is kind of interesting. I'm an exercise physiologist. Running is not a the best form of cardio that I can think of because it's high intensity, which means and it's like high impact, right? High impact for sure. Yeah. I used to love running. I my students back in the day used to hate going running for me with me because I would take them through the trenches. Yeah. And I've done it so much now to where my doctor's like, you shouldn't you run. Your it. spine is just I, trash. I love, I love to run. I enjoy running, which mm-hmm. is going to sound crazy because I, I, I really do enjoy running. Now, the last six months, I've had kind of a foot injury that's prevented me from being able to run. But again, that's a foot injury because of running. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two things about running that – that is very valuable as a fighter. And I don't think that fighters fully understand this. It's not, you're not running for cardio. There are better ways to get cardio. There are low impact ways to get cardio that you're going to get much better returns, much better returns. Go walk on the stairs at your local gym mm-hmm. uh, on like six or seven speed. That thing's going to have, that's going to have a cardiovascular effect on your heart in a way that you are not mentally prepared for. It's going to kick your butt. And it's going to be almost no impact because you're not landing hard. But Mm -hmm. there's two things about running that are very valuable. The first one is that, you know, you've heard of shin splints. When you're running, you're building your low bone density. So you're building that the shin bones are, you know, you're getting that, you know, essentially micro fractures. Those micro fractures, if your nutrition is on point, are going to build back stronger. You're going to have a better bone density uh, because of that. So Muay Thai fighters love to run because it builds low bone density. That means that when you check kicks, you're going to get the better of that check. But the ultimate reason that people run for fighting is that mental barrier. Because if you're a runner, you know this. When you first start running, at some point you run into this barrier of, I don't want to do this. This sucks. Why am I doing this? Oh, I've how long have I been running? I feel like I've been running forever. Okay, I've only been running six minutes. Mm-hmm. I just got to keep running. And then you break through that wall, that mental wall. And then, frankly, you could probably run for much longer than you'd have imagined. Like, I, I've had times where I was running 10 miles five days a week, and I would get a mile in. And I'd be like, this sucks. Why am I doing this? I hate running. Like, it's cold out or it's warm out. Or, man, I, I should have, you know, created a different playlist. Like, whatever. And then I break through that wall and I'm seven, eight, nine miles in and my timer says, okay, you can stop running now. And I'm like, eh, I could run another mile or, oh, I'm, I'm kind of further away from my car than I thought I would be. So let me run a little further so I don't have to walk to my car. But you have to learn how to break through that mental barrier. And once you understand how to break through that mental barrier in one place, you can break through that mental barrier anywhere. Mm-hmm. And my example will be this. Last year, I got uh, scuba certified, which was a, a, a long, complicated story that's kind of humorous and kind of awful as well, uh, but I got scuba certified. And as a part of that scuba certification, I had to get, um, I had to do a tread water test where I had to tread water for 10 minutes. And uh, I was really nervous about it because like, as a grown adult, when's the last time you tried to just tread water in a pool for, mm-hmm. for 10 plus minutes? I was like, man, I don't know if I can do that. Like, I'm not the world's best swimmer, which I know sounds crazy because I went and got scuba certified. But apparently those are two very unrelated things. Scuba, scuba diving and swimming are not even right. the same. You're just in, they're both in water. So I said to my friend who's a lifeguard, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of nervous about this. And he's like, he's like, it's just like running. He's like, you're, there's going to be a wall that you're going to run into. You're going to feel like you're going to drown. You're going to feel like it's awful. you got to break through that wall, and you're going to be all right. And I was like, all right, man, if you say so. you know. So I go to the pool, and I had a private guy, which is me and him. And uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like, all right. He's like, whenever you're ready, we're just going to jump in the water. you got to push off from the wall. He's like, well, we have a clock right here, and there's a big clock on the wall. And um, you know, once you get to 10 minutes, um, you know, you're good. You, you pass the, you pass the test. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, so I get in the water, I push off the wall and I start treading water and, you know, I'm looking at the clock and I get about a minute and a half in and I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do this like this. 
this I'm looking at the clock and I'm treading water and I'm like this the, I can't there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this like I'm gonna this is gonna suck like I paid all this money to I paid like a thousand dollars to get scuba certified and it's, it was just a waste of money and I just literally like just turned away from the clock and I start I looked up at him and I said hey man could you like tell me a story or something are you allowed to talk to me he's like yeah you know he's like what do you want to hear a story about and I was like I don't know, dude. You got to tell me something, though. He's like, well, I mean, uh, my boat sucked, and I sunk one time, and I was in the water for 18 hours. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, yo, we were asleep. Apparently, the boat caught on fire. Like, we all had to get out of the boat. He's like, we didn't have time to get on our scuba gear, so we literally just threw it in the water. And then, you know, once we got in the water, then we got all our scuba gear on. And we just basically, because they have, like, you have, like, a buoyancy compensating device, which allows you to float in the water. Mm -hmm. He's like, so once we inflated our BCD, he's like, man, we just floated there. We just we just chained each other in together, and we floated there for 18 hours. He's like, and then, like, you know, finally, like, the um, they were in another country. He's like, the whatever people showed up, and they... Um, they the you know a sailboat showed up and they pulled us out of the water and they brought us to shore and then like 12 hours later the uh local coast guard for that country posted that they saved us and we had never met them and i'm like man this is a crazy story and we're like talking about it and i'm like i'm like yo man how much how much time have i left he's like oh uh you were done about five minutes ago and i'm like what and i literally like you know like treaded my body around and looked at the clock and it had been like 15 minutes mm. and i was like oh it's crazy and then i treaded back around and i talked to him for like three more minutes in the water. I was like, so what happened? Like, did you guys get your stuff back or whatever? And he's like, no. So I ended up treading water for 18 minutes when I only needed to tread water for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But that first two minutes where I was going through that mental break of like, I'm going to drown. Like, this sucks. Because I had so much experience breaking through the mental wall of jogging, of running, it was very easy for me to translate and go, okay, you know, I need to think something else. I need to go somewhere else. But if you don't have practice breaking that mental barrier... That's going to be very hard for you. So I guess my question would be, how often are you working on like, you know, Goggins says, do one thing that sucks every day and mm -hmm. it makes you a better person. I think there's a lot of truth to that as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. All right. Next question. Clinch sparring, clinch sparring. What are the do's and don'ts? Do clinch sparring. I think that's probably a good idea. <laughs> Um, don't cut your partner. Yeah, I think, again, a lot of this goes to the golden rule. Treat how others, how you want to be treated. Uh, the big don'ts, basically just don't break the rules. Don't don't knee the groin. Don't uh, hit the back of the head. Um, I know, like you said, and this is common for a lot of gyms, they do uh, clinch sparring with no, no gloves on. No gloves. Right. Um, so clip your fingernails. Fingernails, toenails, yeah, please. Um, you know, don't uh don't smack with the palm. <laughs> Grip. You know, there's a difference. Like yeah. uh, you know, don't poke the eyes, you know. Essentially just do the rules. I think that um so that you know, one of the reasons a lot of a lot of gyms don't clinch spar with gloves is because the velcro of your of your glove can scratch up the back of your head and neck like really really badly mm -hmm. um and when we're fighting usually we'll tape you in your gloves which mitigates some of that but then also um you know it allows you to i think it allows you to learn to grip and to manipulate your hands in a way that's a little bit um a be bit of a better educational tool um but I think that's a pretty simple question. I'd say, like, follow the rules. Yeah. You know, don't, you know, you're touching them with your knee. You're not penetrating your, your knee through them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this one's a big a big deal for me. Don't fight every position. You know, yeah. I often say, like, when you're clinch barring, you should be, like, on Percocet. Like, you're just, like, on Vicodin. Or you're, like, you know, I, I teach kids, and I'll be like, oh, you, you've had too many Tylenol PMs. You know, like, um, you, you don't need to be at 100%. You know, I know that's, again, percentage is kind of a debatable thing. But I like my guys when they clinch bar to be just really relaxed and flowy. And, like, you're not Gumby. You know, you're not, like, Mr. Slinky. But you're also not, like, just cranking on people's heads. Yeah. I always tell my guys, like, if you if you believe you're that much better than them, prove it by putting yourself in bad positions and escaping them. Let them, them. work. Yeah. Let them work and then um, get out of it. 
the most common error, and this is a big don't, they get double collar tie mm-hmm. and they don't let go. And they just wrench the gut. And then they just, hard, hard, yeah, hard, and it's hard. just like, I'm winning, I'm yes. winning. I'm like, yeah, you are winning, but you're not getting better. So usually what I'll say is that if I secure like a, um, a double co- collar tie, um, I you know throw like two knees and then get really loose. Don't give it up, but just get really, really loose so that the other guy can like escape from it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, let him work a little bit. And then whatever position he puts himself in, see if you can work from there. So maybe he's got like um, a head and arm or something. Can you, uh, can you knee? Can you score from there? Because in, in, you know something that I try to explain to my athletes all the time is that there's no one position in clinch that's like you're you're you're, you're unable to be scored on. I can score from any position. I tell my guys this all the, all the time. You can have your double collar tie, and I could finish you from wherever I'm at. Like I I don't care. Like I can beat you from anywhere. Um, that's my mentality or that was my mentality as a fighter. I can beat you from anywhere. Um, so yeah, I'll get guys that, that crank down on double collar tie and I'll be like, you should really go a little bit lighter and mm-hmm. they don't. And then I will just beat the hell out of them from wherever I f- I'll let them keep that and I will, I'll beat them up. And once they get loose, I'll sweep them or dump them hard. And then I'll be like, you shouldn't have held on so high tight to that. Cause yeah. it wasn't as valuable as you thought it was. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, some other don'ts, I would say, and this is just an issue uh, I really kind of recognize now that I run the point Muay Thai, is do legal sweeps and dumps. Yes. Le- again, understanding understanding this, the rules. Yes, this is a big problem that I think a lot of schools have because, and this is, this is going to go back to, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but this goes back to coaching. As a coach... You have to understand the rule set of of not just one. St- Listen, in Florida, there's like five rule sets. So there's um, international rules, which is no. Um, is it's basically that's kickboxing. So you can punch, and I can kick. Mm-hmm. There is modified Muay Thai, where there's no elbows, um, and I can only need the body. There's full rules Muay Thai where I still can't el- uh, knee the face, but now I can elbow with elbow pads. Um, there is a style that is called full contact. There is a style that is called um, with the throws. What is it? San Sansao? San Shao or San- Sanda. Sanda. Both of those, yeah. Um, there is... Uh, oh, there's another one. God. Anyway, there's like in Florida... I coach in Florida. There's like five or six amateur kickboxing rule styles. You don't need to coach all of them. You just need to have at least an understanding of what the rule sets are. Because you might get into a situation where, you know, my guys typically fight in either international rules or they'll fight in modified Muay Thai. So what happens is when we go to a tournament, um, like the World Classic, I will try to put the guy, you know, because it's by weight class. So if I have two guys that are the same weight class, same number of fights, they would be the same weight class, same division, but there's different rule sets. So I'll take the guy that has better clinch and I'll put him in modified Muay Thai because he's better in clinch. And the guy that has maybe not as good clinch, I'll put him in international rules. So it's punching and kicking, which is what kickboxing is. Yeah. And um, and we I've actually won two world titles in international rules even though I don't teach international rules in the gym, but it's very easy for us to say to a fighter, like, hey, you can just kick and punch him. Right, yeah. You know, like, no clinch, just kick and punch. Okay, cool. You know, um, you got to understand the rules. And and when it comes to clinch sparring especially, you have to understand what are the rules. And a lot of MMA schools, when they get into clinch, you'll see their guys start trying to go for, like, head and arm throws, hip throws, Mm -hmm. and it's not legal in Muay Thai. And it ends up like can be really devastating because if if I threw the guy hard enough, in theory, that's yeah. a disqualifying throw, right? Like he's hurt, and I did an illegal technique. I'm gonna lose that fight because of it. You know, at best, I'm gonna get a no contest. And and if you're way ahead and you do some like a like an inside, like an inside leg trip, which is illegal, or you know something like to that extent, it's just a sloppy way to, um, it's a sloppy way to lose a fight yeah and and again it would embarrass me as a coach if i have a fighter who's continuously breaking rules because that's a reflection of my teaching yeah 
and I hate being embarrassed. But are you the coach <laughs> that knows the rules? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, no. And again, like, don't sign them up for a rule set that you yourself don't understand. One of the things that I, you know, we did, um, we do like sparring, uh, um, like uh, group. We do like open sparring at my gym where I'll, I'll invite a bunch of gyms in, and you'll see other gyms where they'll they'll be well, we're Muay Thai sparring, and they'll go into clinch, and then they'll try to hip throw, mm-hmm. and I'll be like, hey man, that's an illegal throw, and they'll be like, what? And, and like it's news to them. Mm-hmm. Like they have to know the rule set. You got you. You got your guys have to understand the rule set. Yeah. And part of that becomes they have if they have to watch fights and they have to watch Muay Thai fights if they're fighting Muay Thai, because they have to understand the rule set. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's that's you. You know, your students are paying you for an education as well. I think that's one of the biggest flaws, and you know, this goes to all students, all coaches. We don't watch enough of our sports sometimes, and it's so crazy that just a an average American citizen will consume three to four hours of a professional sport a week. Sure. But a guy who trains and fights Muay Thai doesn't consume three to four hours of Muay Thai. Yeah. And I've said this before too. Um, I, I've been doing like a film study this week where I show my students um, the Paula Costa fight where he fought um izzy uh adesanya Mm -hmm. and i just look at the first round it's two round fight right but i just look at the first round where izzy basically shuts him down with a round kick to the leg and an oblique kick to the leg and izzy is um he's you know fainting the round kick by just shifting his hips Mm -hmm. and paul acosta is biting on that that's super cool but the truth of the matter is is that if that's the fighting that you're watching you're watching two super high level fighters that understand feints and fakes. Mm-hmm. Because I say this to my guys all the time, man. If you faint something and the other guy didn't understand that it was there and he didn't react to it and he doesn't there's no reaction to it, it gives you some information, but it also was a waste of your energy. Mm-hmm. So you need to watch you need to watch fights in your like, what is the local Muay Thai? What does the local MMA look like in your area? Because that's where you're going to compete. Yeah. So what works? What doesn't work? One. Two, what's a 145-er look like in your area? Right? I mean, I think that's something you need to understand. What does a 155-er look like in your area? Because, man, a 185-er in Orlando is a monster. Like, mm-hmm. that dude is going to probably be shredded. He's in great shape. He looks awesome. So if you got a guy come in your gym that's like, you know, wants to compete and he's overweight and you're like, well, what, what way are you thinking about? He's like, oh, 185. You might be like, yo, dude, the 185 guys in this town are huge. Yeah. So do you really want to be a one 185? You know, like maybe you're like a 175. Maybe you're like a 165. Um, so that's one. Two, um, I was going to say that you need to watch the rule set that you want to compete in. You know, it's cool if you're watching, you know, the UFC all the time. But if you're trying to be an, a boxer, you're not going to get the same data from that. Or if you're yeah. trying to be a Muay Thai fighter, you're not going to get the same data from that. Um, you need to watch your sport, man. Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent. I um, I always tell people, like, especially if they're looking to compete, like we are jaded by professional fights. Sure. Go watch your, yeah. like you said, go watch your area, go watch your regional goes and then go a step above that. What is the better region uh, that's nearby? Yeah. Like, you know, in Muay Thai, we can point out like some of the top regions. Um, you know, you got New York, you got California, those guys, they are very good traditional Muay Thai, but then you have some off kind of areas that are really good at other styles of kickboxing or Muay Thai. Um, like in South Carolina, there's a lot of good Dutch schools. Sure. Um, you got to know that. If you're fighting a guy from South Carolina on a local card, but you don't know what the South Carolina scene looks like, you may be in for a surprise. And I think that, that I, um, a coach that I follow that I'm friends with posted on his Instagram last week. It was like, how often are you doing film study? Mm-hmm. And it's true, man. Like Even as a coach, like you need to be watching video. Yeah. I spent about an hour last night just watching sweeps and because I can't teach every sweep. I don't have that experience. That's probably the weakest part of my game is sweeps, but I have to watch it to, because again, with the point Muay Thai, I'm like, all right, I need to see perfect examples of sweeps and dumps, what's legal, what's not. And if I just watch highlights, 
then I'm just going to see both. I'm going to see illegal and legal sweeps. Yeah. I have to watch full fights. Yeah. And in those full fights, I'll see those same sweeps, but I'll see the ref go, no, 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 that doesn't score, or fight. Keep yeah, going. yeah. Or, and also, I think in, you have to go watch some Muay Thai instructionals and yeah, understand, that was, like, that was a part of hey, it as well, this yeah. is... You know, this is what an inside sweep is supposed to look like. This is what an inside leg sweep or outside leg sweep is supposed to look like. This is what an inside trip is. An inside trip is an illegal. So that's what the difference is between these two things. This is what an outside trip looks like. This trip is illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hey, I can do, I, I caught his leg. I can do this or I can do that. But if I do this, that would be an illegal sweep. It'd be legal in MMA. Yeah. But it's illegal in Muay Thai. And that's the issue, I think. Again, it just comes with the area. Some schools are just more understanding of what's legal and what's not, and they yeah. don't. They might not even have the ability to express it with words, but they can show you. Yes. And again, you know that comes from the coaches. Um, so I I've, I've been just doing it just to kind of educate myself m- further, reinforce yeah. some ideas, but also that way when I go and talk to these other gyms and schools and just be like, hey, make sure you guys are practicing the legal sweeps. And this is how you can know the difference from what's legal and what's illegal. And that's just from one hour out of my day on a Saturday. And it could have been more. Yeah. And I plan on doing more. For sure. But, but you have to do film study. You have like to do that. film study, man. Yeah. And, and, and the same thing, if you're a judge, mm. you should be doing some film study and turn, watching some fights. Turn man. the commentary off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep keep a piece of paper. Give your tens and nines you or eights. You need to figure out, and, and why did you disagree or agree with them? Mm-hmm. Um, and also, if you don't understand something as a judge, ask someone. I had a, I had a judge at P- PKB. I was refereeing, and after a round, he asked me, like, hey, in clinch, when the guy did this, does that count? Yes, yeah, it does count. It counts as a, as a sweep. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's that's a solid question to ask, man. Yeah. Because you're the judge, and I'm I by no means do I expect that you understand every technique. Okay, I get that. But if you're not, you know, willing to, if your ego is so intense that you can't ask, like, hey, I'm not sure if that scores or it doesn't mm-hmm. score, just ask somebody, man. It's not that's not an embarrassing question. In fact, I will think that most people will respect you more if you ask another official. Or you ask a referee, or you ask um, the organizer, "Hey, um, does that score or does that not score?" Yeah, is, is are those two valued the same? Like I, I don't know, you know. Um, hey, this guy got need a bunch, and then the other guy was able to sweep him or dump him from the position. Does it score? I mean, yeah, but then you have to decide, like, hey, did those five knees outscore the dump at the end that the other guy pulled off? I don't know. Yeah, you know, you the judge have to decide that. I can't make that decision for you. But how much film study are you doing? Mm-hmm. Whose question was that? Yours or mine? I don't remember. I think that was yours. Oh no, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I gotcha. It's a, it's a so, hard game, guys. <laughs> should I spar outside of my weight class? Uh, I think we've covered that already. Um, I think at first you have to, because you're not going to have. You know, if you're new, you can't just say, oh, no, I'm only sparring with people that are this weight because you might not even understand what your weight class is. Mm-hmm. I would say that you should try to spar with people that are similar height to you. Yeah. Um. But, you know, ideally, you want to get to a point where you have maybe people that are one or two weight classes above you and one or two like, weight classes below you, mm-hmm. and you kind of stick to that territory. I have... um. I have a group of girls that I call Team Tiny, and they're all like less than like 130 pounds. There's five of them now, so I kind of like I like them to all spar together. Mm-hmm. And I'll often say like we have um, a couple of our guys in the gym that are more than six feet tall. I'll say, hey guys, when we're doing group sparring, I don't I really don't want to see Team Tiny sparring with with Team Ginormous over here. Like, doesn't make sense for my five my four eleven 105 pound girl to be sparring with my 6'4", 240-pound heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Like, what are they going to get out of? Neither of them are anything of value out of that. And it's funny because some of my more seasoned competitors now, someone will ask them to spar, and they'll be like, hey, I'll spar with you, but, like, Paul's going to get upset about it because we're so far away from each other in weight class that it doesn't make sense. And they'll be like, really? And I'll be like, yeah, but, you know, we can spar, but, you know, I'm I'm 240 and you're, like, 130. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a good idea because it just yeah what what real life situation are we going to get in yeah where i'm fighting yeah someone almost 100 pounds less than me you know i mean hopefully never 
<laughs> all right. That was an easy one. That was fast. Yeah. If, if only they were all that fast. Um, I'm a new student. When should I start sparring? So, like I said, I have a process with my guys. Uh, you take class. That's your – that's – that's – could be two weeks that could be eight weeks that could be man you're not getting this at all you know just wait for the invite and it could be beyond that i think a general for a person who's consistently coming to class i always found it within the realm of four to six weeks yeah i will get you in sparring drills and within that time a week or two maybe you can come to like your first sparring session so for me in total it will be on average eight to nine weeks of consistent training. That's for me. And again, a lot of people think I play it really safe. I sometimes feel like I don't play it safe enough. Yeah. But that's just my my take on it. So uh, my very brief answer on that would be talk to your coach. Ask them when they think that you should start coming to sparring. Um, as a coach, I want to know that you can at least defend yourself. I don't necessarily care if you can be offensive, but I want to make sure that you're going to not be... Um, you're not going to get hurt. Um, the way that I usually run sparring is similar to Rich, where the first p- kind of part of class we'll have some uh, sparring drills or like sparring based games that are um, safe, very safe. And then the second half of class we'll do, um, we'll actually do the sparring. So I'll kind of be like, well, like, you know, see how they progress, then have them go to those. If they look pretty good in them, you know, then I'll have them sit and watch sparring. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a big one. Um, just come and watch. See if it's something that you'd be comfortable with. I can come and stand next to you and talk to you for two or three rounds. Watch this guy. Watch yeah. that guy. Notice the difference. Um, you know, pick up on the – notice how no one has said, I'm sorry yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's no I'm sorry yeah. here. Um, just like little things like that. Get them used, again, to the energy and the atmosphere yeah. without thrusting them into it right away. And also I think, too um – one of the ways that we learn is through is through visual learning. You know, I think people always think that they have to physically be a part of that. Man, I, when my guys get hurt, especially, they, they're still expected to come to sparring, and they sit and watch, and they sometimes they'll even walk around and kind of help referee and, mm-hmm. and make things that are sure everything is super goes helpful. well. Super helpful but for like, everyone involved. Yeah, you don't need to just be physically involved in something. You mm-hmm. can listen. You can watch. Um you know that's why we do the podcast. Uh, it's we have the the YouTube version of the podcast, obviously, but we also have the audio version of the podcast. There's different ways to learn, and you know just because you, you know, you can't physically be involved in sparring, I would say as a new student, I would ask immediately if you can at least watch sparring mm-hmm. because, hey man, if people are getting you know clipped and hurt and bleeding and knocked out in sparring that might be a sign that you shouldn't even be at that school to start off with you know who knows you know like maybe that's a good way for you to find out before you spar that this is a bloodbath man like yeah. i shouldn't be a part of this at all you know yeah like i said before when i get a, a student in the gym and they go oh when's your sparring day it's a bad sign it's a bad sign so it's immediately like Oh, you know, just come to class first. Let's just worry yeah. about that. Well, I saw on the schedule it's Fridays. It is, but it's an invite only thing. So. I don't. I, I, regretfully have it on the schedule, and for years I tried to have it not on the schedule. But I, I finally I had to get put it on the schedule so that people, when they did show up, I could be like, oh, it says sparring. That's why you can't train because you can't. You're not ready for sparring. Um, I kind of on a side note, sometimes when I, I, I've been doing commentary and judging and refereeing at events now, and sometimes I'll say to people that I meet, I'm like, Oh, you know, I'd really love it. If you come train with us sometime, come train with us sometime. This is not me inviting you to sparring. (laughs) This is me inviting you to training. Right. If you then follow up and message me and be like, yo, when's your sparring day? I've lost all interest. I will usually say to you, like, no, 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 I'd like you to have come in for a drilling. Come in for drilling. Come in for, you know, just to work with the team. Like, if you just got beat up at a fight, you don't need to come in for more sparring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, one thing I did want to bring up on that, for those who don't know, in jiu-jitsu, it's not uncommon, and it's actually becoming more common that, you know, you have to earn a stripe or two sure. on your white belt before you can roll live, yeah. which is the sparring equivalent of, you know, yeah, jiu jitsu. Sure. So when people go, Oh, I have to wait six weeks or eight weeks till I spar, I'm like, if you were to do jiu jitsu regularly, you're having to wait six months. I, I, um, and this is for your protection. Yeah. I, I used to train with Bruno Moffacini. Uh, Bruno Moffacini is a 10 time world champion um, in Brazilian jiu jitsu, and he's a, 
Um, he's, he's, you know, kind of intense, kind of old school, but he does not allow you to spar until you have two stripes on your white belt. Mm -hmm. And if you know Bruno Malfacini, you know that it could take you a year to get two stripes on your white belt. He's very intense about that. Um, and you know, I don't train with Bruno anymore, but I, listen, I understood his, his philosophy on that and people will get hot about it. They would be like, Oh, I've been training here for four months and I haven't been able to spar. Bro, it's, we're not trying to take that away from you. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that you can protect yourself before you get into an environment that can be overwhelming. Yeah. And we have all, if you've been in this game, everyone has seen that person that came to sparring or they came to roll and they, they got overwhelmed mentally and then it broke them and they never came back. Yeah. You know, I've, I can name a million people that have been kicked a little harder than they should have been kicked or punched a little harder than they should have been punched in sparring and it broke them and they never returned. See, I can't name them you because know. they didn't stick around long enough. <laughs> yeah, f- fair, fair, fair. <laughs> but it happens often. More like very, the, the guy with often. the blue shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember a guy with uh, no hair, big beard, head kick. First yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Never came back. Never came back. <laughs> All right. What are you thinking? All right, let's see. Hard sparring versus tech sparring. What's the ratio of time spent doing both? Uh, okay. Um, so technical sparring is when we're sparring. We're really not trying to. Um, we're, we're really we're looking to score points. You know, a, a whole PKB points, not power. Um, we are trying to you know work on our game and development, and all this other stuff. Hard sparring for me is something that I'm probably going to do very rarely. And it's going to be something where, you know, I have a guy that's getting ready for a fight, you know, and he's he needs some some really hard rounds to, you know, maybe build some confidence or maybe for us to test them and see if like if he's actually ready for a fight. Um, But I would say that 90, 75 percent to 90 percent of the time I'm doing technical sparring and very rarely we're doing we're doing hard sparring. But I, I think it does have a place. Yeah, I mean, I feel majority should be tech sparring. Yeah. Again, if you're not planning on competing or you're only there to help the competitors, a majority of your time is not preparing for an actual fight. Mm -hmm. The common complaint I have about that is people are like, well, I do this for self-defense, so I want to look, even light sparring, you're going to be light years ahead of the average guy. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, like you don't need that, you know, everyone's like, I need to practice my timing. Yeah. I promise you your timing's better than the guy throwing from back here. Yeah. Well, first off, anything works against someone that knows nothing. Yeah. Like I say this all the time. If the guy's tired or knows nothing, anything works. Okay. I've I have, you know, I worked in uh bars and I did private security for a really long time. And I will tell you this, I have pulled off the most ridiculous things against someone that was drunk, mm-hmm. that was being aggressive, or uh, some guy that knew nothing, just like, ignorant to yeah, everything. You just they just don't know what you don't know will kill you. Mm-hmm. Um, I we do we call it tuning exams from from some anime that are guys like okay yeah. I have no idea. Uh, we do we call it tuning exams, which was which is our way of saying hard sparring, mm-hmm. and we do it one time a quarter, so one time every four months basically we'll do a hard sparring session, um, and that's kind of just and and I'm really picky about who that is, and it's only three rounds. And sometimes it's only two rounds of right. hard sparring. So it's not like you're going to, it's not like 10 rounds of hard sparring. It's sometimes it's like two rounds, three rounds of hard sparring every three months or something crazy. Um, the guys love it. It's their favorite time of the of the year. But I'm going to be honest with you. I've had people that got clipped in hard sparring that never came back. Mm-hmm. I think every time we've done it, we've lost two or three people. Yeah. So from a, from a, you know, a business perspective or from like a growing your student base perspective, you know, and then you have to ask yourself the question, does someone that has no intention of actually competitively fighting, should they ever be hard sparring? And and if you were to say no, I think I would understand. I yeah. think I would I could see your perspective on that. Yeah, again, it's it's understanding and there's guys who could hard spar, but maybe they just have a job that doesn't allow black eyes or yeah, you know, you, you don't know, want to go in with a crooked nose. Or, day, you know, yeah, like, like you can't be limping. Like maybe you love all your teeth. I, yeah, I don't like, know. There's so many factors that go into it that people don't consider because sparring is seen as like the most fun. Um, oh yeah, everybody wants to spar. Everyone loves sparring, yeah. but 
the consequences are the least fun. No fun. No fun <laughs> in the consequences. So when guys are hard sparring often, um, you know, they're having a great time, but at what risk? And again, for me, we are just now learning about brain injuries oh, CTE, and CTE. Yeah. Like that wasn't even a term when I started martial arts. And now it's, you know, said every day. Yeah. Jokingly. Just, yeah. oh, there's signs of CTE. It's like, oh, we should probably take that a little more serious. And yeah. how do we prevent or prolong uh, getting this horrible mental condition? That Look, the, <sighs> CTE is not a joke, man. Uh, and we do. And I will say, admittedly, because it's like when you work in any, high, in, in any high-risk industri- industry, sometimes you joke about the things that are terrifying. Yeah. Right? You know, oh, like, I might lose my leg today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put my hand in this machine. It's going to be over. Right. Um, CT is real, and I'm going to be honest with you. I have worked with coaches that had CT that, without question, there was there before was, I knew what that was. Yes. I knew these people had CT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew there was something wrong with them. Like I knew that they had just been they had they had they were punch drunk. Mm-hmm. Like they that's just, the term we used yeah, growing yeah, yeah, up yeah. was punch drunk. Yeah, and it always was like that in itself sounds like almost yeah. like a jokish kind of thing. Yeah, and I I talk to people, older people now, that are um like they slur their words or they have it sounds like they've been drinking and and that that's a that's a a, a result of hard sparring and i'm gonna tell you another part of that usually when i meet those guys they came out of gyms where they were hard sparring four or five days a week where people were regularly getting knocked out and they would get back up and three rounds later they'd be sparring again mm-hmm. man we got to really limit our head head damage and i'm gonna be honest with you i think that from a sports perspective we have a sport where we could completely eliminate CTE. I don't think that we need to have it. This isn't like other sports where they're competing every weekend and they're taking hard hits every weekend. You know, the average fighter in the United States is only fighting four or five times a year at the most. Like there's no reason for any of our guys to develop CTE. But where's the CTE coming from? It's coming from your heart sparring too often at your gym. Um, I believe, and if you if you talk to someone like you know Max Holloway, I'm sure he would probably agree with me that um, y- you can get a lot of benefit from just you know freelance drilling and technical sparring. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you another thing: I I um, was in Vegas and I had the the privilege of being at a conference with Forrest Griffin, and Forrest Griffin was one of my big heroes growing up, and I was like so starstruck. And he said in the conference that his biggest regret was that when he was training that they would hard spar five minute rounds, 10 to 15 rounds multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. And that it was a big mistake and he regrets it greatly. And he didn't go into any more depth from there, but we've also seen other guys in our industry that are kind of in that same time period. Now that they have like verbal issues or they have trouble kind of keeping ideas together. And that is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the saddest things to see. And again, like, if it's my fighter, I I take it very serious. I don't like seeing something I could prevent yeah. through my coaching, through my training, that they fall victim to. Because I, I, even if they say, oh, that was my choice, that was my, I understand. But also, I'm going to take blame no matter what. I think as a coach, as a, if you're a great coach, you take blame for stuff that's not your fault all the time. Yeah. Because we internalize and we say, oh, I shouldn't let that happen. Yeah, we could have done this. We could have done that. What do you, yeah, next question. We're kind of pushing through here. I got one. I got one. I already already pulled one. I'm a cheater. Or you can read yours and I can read this one next. What do you got? Well, this one's a a long one. Oh, no. It's a coach to coach question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I've got a student with really solid technique, trains pretty consistently, but when it comes time to spar, he can't pull the trigger. Ends up covering up the whole time and just setting oh and getting beat up g looks like an s sorry (laughs) just getting beat up he's trained 18 months help me figure out this puzzle okay so i got this one uh somebody messaged me this one and um i read it and i was like you know i don't know and i thought about it for a while and i i still (sighs) i don't know man that's a really hard question because this is something i think we debate a lot in our industry killer instinct how do I teach killer instinct? Um, you got a guy that's technically proficient. He can hit mitts well. He knows how to do the drills well. He's been training with you for almost two years. 
And when it's time to spar, he just gets beat up. He just covers and he doesn't he doesn't take chances. Um, and I have the same problem too sometimes with fighters where you have guys that are technically very proficient and when they get into the fight, they can't the exchange or they're not willing to take risks. Because that's at the end of the day, this is the hard part about fighting. You have to create, you have to do stuff. And when you do stuff, it creates openings. Like in jujitsu, for me to start attacking, I have to open my guard. If I just hold my guard as tight as I can and lock the guy down, he really can't do anything. I can't really do anything. But mm-hmm. once I start to open my guard and start to put my feet on the hips and start to try to like go to stuff, I'm opening myself up for chance. I have to take risks to to score, right? Sure. Um, so that's that's a hard question and i don't really know how to answer that question yeah again it comes to a confidence thing and some people are different and some people um i i know i've had the issue with a lot of students that have had the same thing where they look great in almost every asset of fighting of training but when it comes to sparring they're just not performing the way they should or could and again you just kind of have to talk to that person and make it realize that if you're going to spar, you have to attack. You have to do damage to this person across from you. I've had high-level people um, who just don't like that concept. They'll go and do it in a fight, but they won't necessarily do it in the gym. And as a coach, it can get frustrating because it's like, I can't tell if you're ready because yeah. you're not pulling the trigger. So uh, my my directly to this case, I don't know the person, 18 months seems like a long time for them not to learn that lesson. I don't know how long they've been sparring, but if they've been training for 18 months, they should have some sparring under their belt. And again, it's it's probably a mental thing. There's some exercises you can do to push them, but it also might be something that breaks them. I would, I guess I would wonder um, how often you're doing like counter for counter drills. So drills where like, this guy throws jab cross, you cover and you return. Mm-hmm. Um, how often are you doing like, um, you know, the, the, those type of drills? Because those are the drills that build confidence yeah. in, hey, I enter, I throw jab cross, I cover my head, and then I return cross to cross or something, right? So like drills where you're like f- attacking, defending inside the pocket and then attacking again. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're doing drills constantly where you're entering and leaving the pocket, um, we did a drill this week where my partner inter- my partner entered with jab cross, they covered their head against jab cross, and then they followed up with cross hook cross. So essentially, they entered with jab cross. The other person tried to steal the exchange, and they retained the exchange, and then they exited. Um, so I think that maybe some of those drills, some maybe some doing some like sparring drills, you know, like um, you know uh, threes. You know, Rich does a drill called threes where he will um, fire any three lines or any four lines or something. You do that drill, right? Yeah, so uh, basically, um, say me and Paul are drilling. I'm going to attack Paul. I'm going to exit. I'm going to attack him again. I'm going to exit. Yeah. And on the third attack, he's going to interrupt me with a counter, and that will be his first attack. Yeah. We will reset. He'll throw a second attack. We'll reset. He'll throw his third. And on that third attack, I counter. That's my yeah. first. So you're stealing the third exchange, essentially. And essentially. And, and basically, this isn't you know the preferred way to fight. This isn't 100% realistic. But you're getting the idea of, I can't let this guy keep attacking me without scoring. Also, I can't attack the guy without having the awareness that I may be countered. Yeah. I, I think that's the thing. You need to create some sparring games. Mm-hmm that maybe will build some confidence in this guy. Because if he understands the drills and he understands the technique, he needs some confidence in the defending and firing back. Yeah. And I think that maybe create some drills. And I'd also talk to him about it. You know, maybe that's a mental thing where you need to have a conversation. I'll tell you the old school way of you, how this would get you taken beat him until he never shows up. Uh, yeah, you batter him until he is either forced to fight for his life or, or he'll quit. Back. He'll quit. That was, Don't do that. That was the old school solution to all of our problems, yeah. right? Like if... You're not man enough. Yeah, if I this is a real this is a real truth, man, and I hate to say this, and it used to be that like we were doing behavior modification via violence. This guy's too rough. Well, then we should go really rough with him so that he knows that rough. Some is... Some people yeah, respond well. <sighs> you know, I Juan, my my good friend Juan Brea says that the reason that toxic masculinity is so powerful is because it quite often works. It's true, man. Because guys are rough to each it, other, yeah. dude. 
You know, like I, I, I bullied Robert into losing 60 pounds. Robert, come on. You're going to be a fighter. You're going to be 60 pounds overweight. Shut up. You yeah. know? Again, it, it, some people do respond that way. I some enjoy, people kill themselves. I enjoy being talked to to motivate me. I enjoy being talked <laughs> to a little bit like a little de- degradation. Like um, yeah. there was a question earlier about how do I change the intensity without getting damaged? And one way I do that with my fighters, not just on sparring day, but in days in general, I talk shit. I'll make fun of them. I'll tell them you're not going to do this to me. You're not going to do that. I create a mind game to where they have to overcome not just the physical aspect, but the mental aspect. And yeah. I encourage them to talk shit back to me. When I'm drilling with my partners, I, so I don't, I do not speak a lot um, during drill. This is kind of one of my beefs actually too, because I I believe that if we're being serious about our training, we're in the moment. So we can talk about the training, mm-hmm. or we can we can kind of fuck with each other a little bit in a in a healthy way. But I don't want to. I don't want like the other day I got mad at someone because they were talking about like some movie they watched, and I'm like, this is an unacceptable conversation during drilling. Sure. Like we we're drilling in the sparring realm. So sometimes what I'll do is like when my partner like my partner clips me a little bit, I'll look at him and shake my head. I'm like, no, yeah, you know, because I'm messing with them a little bit. But I also am trying to teach them like bravado and swagger and how to like how to you know in a real fight you know how to like you know have conversations with your opponent not about what's the movie that's playing Mm -hmm. about like hey man you're not you're not winning this fight i'm sorry what's happening yeah right now no one's coming to save you yeah it's me and you we're here Mm -hmm. you know we're stuck behind these two mics okay (laughs) next question are there different rules when sparring with a girl um so for me dangerous territory (laughs) so for me no Okay. Will be my like simple answer. There is no rules outside of what you would do with other guys. So yeah. earlier we covered size difference. Size difference. So it's like, okay, this guy's smaller than me, so my sixty percent is not gonna do the same sixty against a guy my size. So generally speaking, most women who train are gonna be smaller or even if they're not smaller, say they're the same weight class, they still may not have the same physical attributes you may have. So Again, coming to my my three pillars pillars of sparring, which sure. is skill development. So doesn't matter male or female, you can have good skill. You can both do damage. Uh, Alana, one of your students, could probably knock me out if I gave her the opportunity. She she kind of clipped me hard last week because I wasn't yeah. paying attention. She's a fourteen like, year old girl. Oh man, God! But when you do technique properly yeah. and you have mean intentions, you yeah. can you can make stuff happen. Man, if I could get Alana some fights, that would be uh, I guys, I have a, a a young lady that fights me. She's 14. She got a lot of fights. Um varied in varied endeavors, okay? So she's not it's not just all like Muay Thai. She's got point fighting, she's got MMA. She's, she's got, got experience. Got, she has experience. Mm-hmm. It's like but she's got she's got so much experience now that she's reached the point that like I can't I can't get her. She's either fighting like a boy or like she's fighting someone that she that she's just way out classing. Yeah. Um the the happiest thing ever happened to us at at the PKB because she got to go against adult women mm-hmm. at the first time that she's ever been able adult to go women who also have experience who also have experience yeah and because normally when she's going up against people her age you know she's been training since she was eight she's fourteen years old right so she needs to she needs to be competing against people who've been training five six years you know and um it's just that, not common it's You're not just common not it's it. not common yeah. you know so it's like thankfully because. Point Muay Thai, there's a little bit of leeway because it's a no knockout tournament because it's more about safety. Like the decision was made, like, hey, you know, we know that Alana's been training a long time. She can go with some adults, and and it was safe. And Alana actually won, mm-hmm. so it wasn't like she was in out, a, a very technical match. It was yeah, yeah it was the super final match clean, was great, super clean. You know, like, um, and she it built some confidence in Alana. You know, but meanwhile, you know, Alana's name is on the list for pretty much every promoter in Florida. Of like, hey, if you have a 14-year-old girl that wants to do Muay Thai, you know, Alana weighs 135 pounds. I'm interested. Yeah. And, and if you're listening, guys, message me. I'm interested mm-hmm. uh, because I can't. That's been hard to find. Yeah. Like, you know, um, a recent promoter messaged me and wanted us to fly out to New York but didn't want to pay for travel or anything. Like, I can't do that. I'm sorry. Like, I'm not, unless you want to sponsor the podcast, guys, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, and then another promoter wanted us to fight the the only other girl in Florida that Alana's already fought, and it was like you know like uh, why we're not going to keep fighting this girl over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it's for development. What's the what's, what's the, purpose? the purpose? Yeah, like I, amateur fighting is about building 
you know, a career and understanding stuff. And if mm-hmm. we're just going to replay the same episode over and over again, like you're just reinforcing what you already knew. Yeah. And there's a point of diminished returns on you that. Know. Or if it, maybe a year goes by, maybe, but not every three months, you know, mm-hmm. and again, not changing much uh, for when you're training with women, sparring with women, trust. Don't just the first time you see her is sparring day. Make sure it's a girl you've, drilled with either, yeah you know or same thing girls make sure you're switching up partners that you may be sparring with in class and then understanding again it just goes into size differences skill levels um what is the rule set today uh what what techniques should i probably stay away from because of the size difference or, or skill difference um just having that understanding yeah. again that comes with time and that that goes both ways men versus men women versus men women versus women it, it's that same concept um i will say this about women initially when they come to sparring i see one of two things and this could be said about guys as well um but for women it's more of an emotional thing for men it's more of an egotistical thing sure. but women when they first come to sparring and this of course changes over time hopefully um they have two thoughts one thought is they're afraid to do well because they're concerned about what may come back to them sure so it's like i don't want to actually land clean because i don't want him to land clean with me especially if he's going to be more powerful um so that's obviously bad for their development because they're not building confidence and attacking they're not pulling the trigger um the other one is you know there's no consequence i'm a girl i can just wail on this guy yeah yeah yeah. and I've seen that a lot. And I've that happens lot. often, yes, too. I've seen it a lot, yes. And there's also that same sense. Guys do that, too. Where girls the girls are like are kicking much harder than I'm kicking. And I'll say to them, like, hey, you can calm down a little yeah. bit. And they're like, I'm not kicking that hard. Like, you're, you're kicking exceptionally hard right and now. And again, guys do that. Like, that's my yes. 60%. Yeah, bro. And, yeah, but it's like, no. And again, that's why, to, in my mind, there should be no difference. Because mm-hmm. a good skill is a good skill. Yeah. If you can swing a bat just as good as a guy at the higher level, you might not have the same weight behind it, but you're swinging that back very proficiently. These are the two the two things that I would I agree with everything you've said. Weight, size are the, the considerations. These are the two uh, caveats that I would add on to that. I'm a physiologist from a perspective of of weight. If you have a man and a woman that are the same weight, typically they're if let's say they have the same lifting age, they work out about the same amount, typically that they'll both have the same lower body strength. So in theory, that means that a 145 pound guy should be able to kick as hard as a 145 pound girl. They should not have, you know, a difference in kicking ability because of the effect of testosterone. Obviously our men are producing testosterone naturally. The effect of testosterone is primarily on the upper body muscles. So that means that men typically in the same weight class are going to have a stronger upper body than women in that weight class. Okay, And we see that in, in Muay Thai athletes, right? Where you see a woman that's, let's say, 135 woman and a 135 guy. Guys typically are going to be a little bit bigger up top than the woman is, right? Yeah, they're going to have a lot more muscular uh, yeah. physique. Shoulders, mm-hmm. arms, all this other stuff, right? Typically. Typ- there are the typically, outliers yeah, that typically we see. outliers, right? So if you are, if you are a 135-pound guy and you're sparring with a 135-pound girl, realize that physically your upper body is probably stronger. So, you know, you're not going to want to be whipping her around and clinch and you're not going to want to be throwing really hard punches at her because her cover is probably not going to be, she's not going to be able to, you know, defend your punches as successfully as you're going to be able to defend her punches because of the physiological differences. My other caveat would be you don't need to treat her any differently than you treat anyone else. And what I mean by that is, is if you don't DM all of your male partners, hey, thanks for the sparring rounds after class. You don't need to DM DM her the same thing, okay? Yeah. That's not what she is there for, and hopefully that's not what you are there for. So you don't need to send a direct message after class every time you train with her. Hey, thanks for training. Now, if that's something that you do with every one of your training partners, fine. But that's the first question I'm going to ask you when one of my female athletes comes to me and goes, "Man, every time I I drill with this guy, he starts messaging me after class." I'm going to go and ask all of your other training partners if you regularly get messaged by this guy. And then if they all say no, then I'm going to come to you and ask you why you are direct messaging the one girl in class every time you drill with her after class. Mm-hmm. Like, 
What's your thing, dude? I haven't had that issue in a while. Oh, I have. But I can see, obviously, like, I've been with a smaller group. Um, but, yeah, dealing with that is... Yeah. That's a big no-no. Again, guys listening who are training who maybe you want to learn the sport of Muay Thai, but you also want to make it a social aspect of your life. Um, cool. Just don't, like, don't, like Coach says, go to the outings. Yeah. You know, be friendly with them in the team aspect. And if something grows out of that, that's Great. different. Great. But if you're uh, first time training with them and now you're their new side coach, yeah. stop. Don't, don't shit Just where stop. you eat, guys. This is your sanctuary. <laughs> this is your sanctuary. I, listen, we had these two people join at this in the same month. Same month. And guy and a girl joined in the same month. And um, we ha- went to a fight. One of our guys fought, and we all went to um, Applebee's or something afterwards. And, you know, they, they the two of them hit it off, and they seemed like they were having, you know, nice conversation, whatever, and I wasn't really paying attention. And apparently they had, they went home together. And, um, you know, a couple days later, the girl was very honest with him, and she said, listen, I'm really not, I'm not looking for anything. I'm sorry. Like, it's just, it's not, it has nothing to do with you. I'm just not interested. It destroyed that guy. He, he could not, whenever he saw her at the gym, he would get upset. He would make a scene. He'd start crying. He would come in and do the warm up, and then she'd show up five minutes late, and he'd see that she was there, and he would leave. And I, I pulled him aside. I'm like, yo, what's going on? And he explained the situation to me, and I'm like, man, like, you, 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 you hooked up with this person one time, and it's ruining your, your whole class, your whole experience now. And she was kind of like, Hey, I didn't. I, I want to be his friend. I didn't see it as that big a deal. Like, I don't understand why he's upset about it. And then he ended up making things so uncomfortable that they both stopped training. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like it, it, it. They ruined it for each other. To me, there's a there's two point seven three billion people of the opposite sex. Don't shit where you eat, man. But I get it. Stuff happens. You know, maybe maybe you're gonna fall in love with the absolute best person of your life. And unfortunately, that lesson gets learned. I feel like in gyms and waves where yeah, other yeah, students, yeah, yeah. other one, students one will see it. it. Yeah, and then they learn. But then time goes on that hasn't happened in a while. I it does repeat itself, yeah, of unfortunately, course, of course. and those involved suffer the most. Yeah. But I, it is a good lesson for others. I was doing a private lesson where this guy, you know, he hadn't been in the gym for a while, and um. He was doing a lesson the other day, and he was like, "You know, man, I took what you said to heart a long time ago. Where uh, you said, uh, you know, don't, don't, because I always say this is inappropriate, but or not maybe not inappropriate. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on a podcast. I always say, don't fuck your brothers and sisters, and I mean that in multiple ways. Like, don't screw over the, your training partners, and it's a law. Yeah, and also don't fuck your training partners. Like, this is not what this is for, you know. And uh, he was like, man, when I saw so and so and so and so have this huge problem at the gym." Man, after you said that, I was like, I'm never going to let that happen to me. He was like, I'm so glad I never did that. And I'm like, yeah, but that's what happens. It happens in waves where mm-hmm. everybody's been, if you're in a gym long enough, you've seen it go bad one time, you know, likewise, if you just started dating someone, don't bring them to the gym. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, let that, let that simmer for a while before you. This is one of the biggest red flags. Uh, hey coach, is it cool if my girlfriend watches no. me spar? No, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not. And in the fact, fact you have to ask me yeah, should tell you no, right away. No, and, and and why? Because you don't two things are gonna happen. One, you might show off because you want your girl or your guy or whatever to see that all this time you've invested was worthwhile. The other side of it is is that someone that doesn't like you may use that opportunity to also show off. I've seen this. I, I had a student a while ago uh bring his dad. To yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> One of my guys, Robert Spazzy Mangillo, mm-hmm. was like, came in the other day. He's like, listen, my um, my cousin wants to come in. I told him no. I told him no. I uh, I told him no, but he's coming in for sparring. And I tried to I tried to stop him, and I don't. I I couldn't handle it. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. And then as a joke, I walked out. And I'm like, hey guys, everybody see that? That's that's um. Uh, Spazzy's cousin there, so whoever knocks out Robert today, I'll give you fifty bucks mm-hmm. cash. You know, like, cut to kind of diffuse the situation. Likewise, every once in a while we'll have a film crew, or we'll have uh, photographers come in for sparring and take photos. It's gonna be it's gonna be bad. Mm-hmm. It always is. I always regret it afterwards. I'm always like, oh my god, everyone was showing off. That's why people got hurt. Like. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things out of out of your hands sometimes, but for the most part, 
like you know my student Becco. Yeah, he'll have his girlfriend parents. Yeah, but they come to every session almost. Yeah, yeah. They're they're there if, all the well, time. Well, they always come. You know, same thing. It's Alana, different. Alana's yeah. a child. I mm-hmm. hate to say that, Alana. I know you don't like that. Alana's a fourteen year old child. Mm-hmm. Her mother comes to every class. Yeah, we're used to her being there. Yeah. You know what I mean? She she's like a, a member of the team at this point. Mm-hmm. You know. But yeah, dude. Like, and again, it's it's a little different in those aspects. But if I've known you for like six months, and then out of nowhere you're bringing your girlfriend today because I've seen you've been training real hard for this moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. ah, buddy. <laughs> I had a I had a buddy that used to bring his kid. You know, a student that used to bring his kid. His, his kid's like seven or eight, mm-hmm. and he didn't have daycare. And he brought his kid, and one day he was getting kind of beat up in sparring, and his kid just did not handle it very well. And then he was like, yeah, I can't bring my kid ever again. Like, I, I, I learned my lesson, you know? Oh, it's so much distraction. You know, we had a guy that used to bring his girlfriend to every session, and then we had a session where he got he got kind of beat up in sparring, and then they, he never came back. And I have to wonder how much of that was because he got, you know, kind of beat up in front of his girl. I don't know. It's not, I, Dude, honestly, even in fighting, I don't want I, – I would prefer my athletes. It's me – the athlete, whoever else is cornering the team, nobody else. Yeah, I, don't need to I really love. I really love out of town fights. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, beautiful. Um, no when problems. I competed, I didn't even tell my like no. my roommates didn't even know no. I was fighting. They were like, "Man, I? you've been training a lot." I'm like, "Yeah, I got a competition." Yeah, why would this weekend? I? <laughs> All right, let's go to let's go to speed round here. What are you thinking? All right, what do you got for me? How uh, long should a sparring round be? Uh, what are you fighting? Yeah, yeah. What are you fighting for? I um, most of my guys fight amateur right now, so we do uh, two minute rounds because amateur fighting in Florida, amateur kickboxing in Florida is two minutes. Um, if you're doing amateur MMA in Florida, probably three minute rounds. You get used to the pacing of a round. Yeah. Um, you know when you're fighting, uh, if you're fighting um MMA and you're doing five minute rounds, that might be a little long. Um. You might not want to do it all of the time, but you definitely need to get used to, especially in camp, the pacing of what does a two-minute round feel like? What does a three-minute round feel like? What does a five-minute round feel like? Yeah, 100%. Uh, Sport-specific, what are you training yeah. for? I think in general, for just kickboxing and Muay Thai, two to three minutes yeah. is plenty of time to get some work. I'm also a fan of repeating a partner. Sure. So it's like if me and you are sparring, let's take a rest and let's spar one more round, and then we'll get a new partner. Yeah, I... um. I think one of the mistakes that I have made in fighting was when we were sparring, let's say we were sparring three minute rounds regularly, and then my guys would go in and compete two minute rounds mm-hmm. and they weren't used to even even though I was thinking like, oh, they'll have better cardio because they're used to sparring three minute sure. rounds, they weren't used to like the the how much time they had to yeah. set stuff up, you know, because like in, in a three minute round you might have a minute and a half to establish something and then a minute and a half to manipulate it. Mm-hmm. Wherein with uh you know, a, a two-minute round, you might have a minute to establish something and a minute to exploit it, or you might still need your, <clears throat> sorry, you might still need your minute and a half to set it up, and then you only have thirty seconds to exploit it. So, uh, sport specific for sure. All yeah. right, next one. Uh, what's the best way to spar for MMA? Do you prefer isolated sparring, like ground and pound, wall work, stand up, or do you prefer full sparring? All of it. Uh, again, it's going to go into game plan. What What is your intention of this fight camp? If you have an intention, you need to put more time in what you're trying to do. Also, if there's like, uh, for instance, um, recently I had an opponent for one of my guys who's really good at grappling, just like this high level grappler. Okay. We're going to spend more time in all of our kickboxing rounds with some grappling yeah so you're never not just doing one or the other um but sometimes yeah like if you need to increase your ability to kickbox yeah isolate your kickboxing i think this is very common for a lot of mma gyms yeah to where they have like one day is like big glove sparring and then another day is small glove sparring um and i'm fine with that i I think there's great sense in that some guys do first half of the sessions big gloves just stand up second half of the sessions small gloves we might do minimum stand up with the small gloves with an emphasis on the ground and cage uh i think initially when you learn uh mma you probably are going to spar more isolated and then as your um understanding of the game progresses you're going to spar a little bit more full um and then i think yeah what is in a camp your coaches are more than likely going to decide where they think the fight is going to live and then obviously they're going to isolate a lot of the sparring for that. So if mm-hmm. I think that this fight is really going to come down to wall wrestling, we're probably going to sp- 
spar a lot more with a lot of wall wrestling. If I think that the guy that you're fighting is going to try to take you to the ground, we're going to really work on, you know, maybe we're really going to work on preventing you from going to the ground and really work on you getting up once you're on the ground. So our sparring should look like that. Sparring should, should resemble what we're, what we're trying to produce in fighting. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, but I think it, it it's that's a very complicated question. We could probably do a whole episode on MMA on, sparring. Yeah, on <laughs> MMA sparring, right? We do a whole episode on on uh, whatever. All right, so yeah, in MMA, what gloves should I spar with? Again, uh, your coaches should be telling you the intention of the round. If that's a stand up round, you're probably using bigger gloves. Unless it's a technical round that's stand up, then you can use smaller gloves. It really shouldn't matter. It yeah. should be about. What's the intention? I think that you could, if with the right training partners, you can do either. Yeah. And make it work. I think that if you only had to pick one, I could, I would probably make an argument that for big glove sparring, because I can, I could probably do some, you know, like, hey, man, if I break a finger in MMA, I got to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, if I get used to sparring with big gloves and not having really good use of my fingers, um, that's probably beneficial to me. Yeah. That, that was a mentality we used a lot at Syndicate was, uh, even though it's big glove sparring day, it's an emphasis on kickboxing and Muay Thai, uh, you are still allowed to wrestle for some of the rounds. Yeah. If you can perform a takedown with boxing gloves on you with can, MMA gloves, it, it, should gloves. Yeah, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, and, you know, obviously it's probably a little bit safer, probably a little bit. Not, I'm not saying significantly. I'm saying it's probably a little bit safer. Um, so if you only had to pick one, I would, I personally would pick big gloves. Um, but... You know, now there's these bubble, the bubble gloves that are kind of like in between where you have the bigger bubble on, mm-hmm. but you have more use of your hands. Uh, you Again, know, trust. Trust. <laughs> what is? What do you think? Hey, um, uh, we're not going to even answer that question. I'm going to skip that one. That was kind of like a repeat of an earlier question. Um, <laughs> how often should I be knocking out my training partners? Never, never. <laughs> um, I, I'm. This is probably a goof of a question. You, you know, we, we, no one should be not getting. We should be limiting our contact injuries in sparring, guys. And if people are getting knocked out, that's a sign that there's something really, really wrong. Now, if it's a TKO via body shot or TKO, oh, yeah. that's leg just classy. Kick. That's just classy, man. And again, it, I will say, in case any of you guys end up sparring some of my students, um. When we are preparing for fights, we often have certain attacks that we are looking for to drop people in sparring, but it's not in the malicious way of like, we're going to, like, today's the day. We're going to, it's like, today's hey, the day. work that shot. If it's working, we know it's working. We don't have to drop the guy. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's not working. So you find an adjustment and then it ends up dropping the guy, like a, a well timed teep against a southpaw or something. Okay. Like, that, you don't have to do it anymore. We know it worked here. There's a, through that, we should know it should work in the fight. And again, we'll keep drilling it, but it doesn't have to be in sparring all the time. I think that if you're in a gym where people are getting really hurt often, then that's a sign that, that you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, headshots, the worst thing to, oh, I need to practice knocking guys out. Cool. Um, you're going to do that on pads, on Heavy a bag. bag. Yeah, yeah. Like buy a bob. Yeah. Buy a bob. So let's get this next one. For Muay Thai, should I do different sparring rounds? Hands only, kicks only, et cetera. Uh, yes, but my caveat is going to be you're still w- within the rule set in theory of of whatever rule set you're in. So, for example, I'm going to say that I do – I've been – lately especially I've been doing um, more boxing only rounds, so hand only rounds, uh, because I'm trying to um, – We've had some failures lately with boxing, mm-hmm. so I'm trying to make sure that my team is good at covering their head and responding back and all this other stuff, um, but they have to stay in the realm of Muay Thai. So what I mean by that is that there's certain strategies that you can incorporate in boxing that you couldn't incorporate if knees and and elbows and feet. Right, a lot and, less Philly yeah. shell, a lot less yeah. hands down taunting. So I would say, yes, of course, yes, absolutely isolate kicking only or isolate boxing only. But make sure that you're still doing it in the realm of, um, you know, what is what would actually happen if you did this in a real MMA, a real Muay Thai or whatever fight. I like I'm, I'm a big fan of isolating like that, but also punches versus kicks or sure. punches yeah. versus knees yeah, yeah, and yeah. punches. And, I think you got to find ways to make it fun, too. Yeah. Um, and also just realizing the dangers of certain weapons. Uh, you know, I always talk to my guys about the most dangerous thing you can do is attack. Well, if I'm a really good kicker, 
and I'm always at kicking range, and this guy's trying to firing kicking range. But if he's only limited to punching versus my kicks, he's gonna fight differently. Yeah, and I need to realize the error of my ways if I get too comfortable kicking all the time. And I think also too, this goes back to tactical resilience. If um, if he kicked my leg really really hard, or something went wrong where I know that I, my leg's compromised, and maybe I'm more of a kick artist myself. Maybe I'm going to have to continue this fight with boxing only. Right. Or if I just broke my right hand and I'm going to really have to work on my left hand tools mm-hmm. um, or my right kick instead. Um, yeah, you never know what's going to happen. You don't know, in a fight. Man. Yeah. And you got to create some tactical resilience. And that that stuff allows you to do it. Mm. Next question. For MMA fights, should my stance be the same when sparring when I'm sparring Muay Thai versus I'm sparring MMA? Uh, I mean, if you have a MMA fight coming up, no. It needs to be what you plan on fighting in. Yeah. Um, if you're, again, s- isolating your sparring and it's uh, I'm going to do stand-up only, the guy I'm fighting is in a Muay Thai stance, should I also match his stance? No, you should... See if your style can beat yeah. that Muay Thai stance, but also is your opponent fighting in a Muay Thai stance? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that you sh- your stance should be the, your stance regardless of what you're wearing. You know, so if you're an MMA fighter and you're and you go into a, um, you know, if you're an MMA fighter and you go into a um, into sparring with boxers. I don't think that you should adopt a boxing stance and try to outbox boxers. Like you're not going to win there. You're, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, you're trying to, you know, perfect what you do. And I think that your stance for me is like, is like your, um, is like your car. You know, it's something that you should be able to get into, and you know where all the buttons are, and you know how everything works. And although your stance is going to change. You know, throughout a round, you might have a little bit of a wider gate or mm-hmm. a little bit of a narrower gate, or you might change your stance a little bit. Um, I my stance should not change based on the activity I'm in. Now, that's one side of it. The other side of it is is that you got to learn how to wear hats. So, for example, in you know jujitsu, they typically stand a little shorter. Mm-hmm. So, when you're taking a jujitsu class, you're gonna sh- you're gonna be down a little bit lower. Judo, they're a little bit taller. So if you go into a, you know, if you're learn, trying to learn judo and you go in to learn judo and you're, you're I don't know, you're kind of emulating a jiu-jitsu stance, that's going to not be beneficial for you learning, like, judo. Um, and your judo coach is probably going to be like, yo, man, like, do the judo stance. So it's, it is a little complicated on that side of it. But ultimately, if you're trying to be a better Muay Thai fighter, you should really learn how to f- work within the stance of Muay Thai. Yeah. If you're trying to be a better MMA fighter, you should really learn how to work in the stance of MMA. Yeah, and and it, like you said too, like you may be the type of guy who switches stances, um, not just orthodox and southpaw, sure, sure, but sure, you sure. might be Thai stance yeah. or low for MMA, or maybe you want to do a little karate bounce. But again, you shouldn't be doing those without the intention of this is what I'm going to do in competition. Unless you're just like the average Joe who's just training and trying to advance skills yeah. for I saw um I saw Wooden Man. He was talking about um uh when he attacks, he's typically uh back foot is on the ball and front foot he's front foot heavy and he's st- walking forward. And that, that was a very aggressive I'm attacking. And then later in the fight, if he was winning, he'd start to put his weight more on his back leg mm-hmm. and be in a little bit more of a kind of that traditional defensive Muay Thai posture because he already knew he was way ahead. Yeah. So your stance will change in a fight, but it has to change for reasons. But in sparring, no, I would try to master and perfect that stance regardless of who I'm in front of. Yeah. Um, now, if, if I'm an MMA fighter that's going to be fighting uh, Muay Thai in my next fight then yeah, maybe I need to emulate a little bit more of the Muay Thai fight because there's a reason they're standing taller yeah. versus a reason in MMA where we're typically standing a little shorter. Mm-hmm. But Speed round. What's the worst injury you've ever seen in sparring? Uh, lacerations near or around the eye. Uh, you know, guys getting fingers in the eyes and like having like a... Like a cut part of their, not badly cut, but definitely a cut up part of their eye. That's probably the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, dislocated shoulder, dislocated elbows. Um, uh, Worse than that, I think knockouts. 
Yeah, that's a brain a, that's injury. Brain injury. Brain injury, right? And it's one of those things, again, we're just now understanding. The first time I saw someone get knocked out was, I don't know, I was like six weeks into training. And I, I was just watching the sparring class. Um, thankfully, they didn't let me spar. <laughs> <laughs> but these two guys were going at it. I think they were both pros, or one's a pro, one's like an amateur. But regardless, the guy got head kicked in the corner of the ring, slept, slept, like the Ow. snores and everything. Yeah. Oh. And, you know, I think back to that, and these guys are two high level, best guys in the gym. Everyone in the gym's watching them for a reason. The coach is literally saying, watch this round because these are the t- the best guys. Yeah, they're showing off. And one guy gets slept. I never saw him again. Yeah, of course. I don't know if he trained again. I don't know. Who knows? But his career changed because of one knockout in the gym. Yeah. Now, if that was a knockout in the ring, that sucks too, but it sucks more now because it was in the gym. Yeah. So, like, those types of things stuck with me. Like, head injuries are, you know, you don't see the damage unless you're with the person. I've had... I'm very blessed to have only dealt with two fighters of mine getting knocked out uh, cold like that. And, you know, I've had a couple guys TKO'd, but they're they're conscious. The, the knockouts. And then, again, seeing it in the gym, thankfully, under my guys, under my uh, running the gym, I haven't had it happen. But um, I've seen it with other people running, and it sucks, dude. It's the worst. Yeah, that, that, that is. I, I think maybe I think about bad injuries as, like, ones that I'm, like, tra- traumatized by mentally in the moment. But, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I, again, another one I had a real close friend of mine who is a fighter, coach, promoter. He, getting ready for a big Muay Thai fight, uh, a guy that is typically someone he could trust and, you know, go hard with and all these things and who is very controlled, he landed a, a spinning elbow off of a caught kick and it was just like well timed but he didn't really need to throw that kind of weight into it just one of those bad moments and that guy can't pass a brain scan now yeah he can't get approved to fight yeah. so now he's just coaching promoter the um <laughs> the entire orlando uh scene has probably been uh really affected by that because if you remember Kembo Slice was supposed to fight Ken Shamrock. And in the warm up, in the back, mm-hmm. Ken Shamrock caught an elbow to the face and got cut. And they decided that he couldn't fight. So there was an, a guy, another guy there. His name was Seth. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, this guy can fight Kembo because Ken can't. And I think Seth knocked him out with a jab. Yeah. And that probably changed that moment probably changed the Orlando martial arts mm-hmm. landscape forever. Yeah, I would say. Which is kinda crazy, right? But yeah. like, hey man, that's that's the the worst elbow Ken ever got in his life, probably, and the best thing that ever happened to Seth. Yeah. hundred you know? percent. Crazy, man. All right. Where are we at here? Um uh how many rounds should I spar each session? Infinite. Infinite. Go till you die. <laughs> No, go until, you know, usually there's a set time, right? Yeah. But even then, I hate seeing guys, like, that are out of shape sparring. Yeah. And they're, like, only, like, four or five rounds in, and they are just getting obliterated. They're Taking a punching bag. Damage, yeah. Sit out, you know. Um, usually, I, I'll pull a guy out. But, again, if I'm not running the session, you know, yeah. there's other rules applied. We but. do uh, ten We do ten. We do ten rounds in, in a sparring session. I don't expect that you're going to do all ten. There are guys that do 10 that are in good shape. As, as long as you're, I think, as many rounds as you're not taking damage, you know, you shouldn't be taking a lot of damage in sparring. Um, but I don't know that there's a cap on it. Sometimes we'll do open sparring events where we'll do like 15 rounds, but not every guy's doing 15 rounds. Um, I just want, there's so many people there. I want to give them enough rounds that if you have to go to the bathroom or whatever, you're mm-hmm. not like stressed out about driving an hour. Um, but I don't know. That's super debatable. And the last question of today. We've done it. We've survived. I mean, this is a 100% yes for me. Should I go 100% beast mode when I spar? <laughs> yeah, why not? 73% beast mode. 78% beast mode, yeah. no more. Um, no, and I think we've kind of covered that uh, uh, r- repeatedly throughout the, the um, podcast, is that, no, you know, when you're sparring, you should be really working on your technique and working on perfecting your ability to... Um, use the things that you've been learning and, you know, control, but no, man, you, I don't, I don't know that you should be going a hundred percent until you're in the, until you're in the cage for your fight. 
And then yeah. you're not even going 100% the entire time. Hopefully not. You're Only picking in your spurts. shots. Yeah. You know? And again, like, you can you can exercise your 100% on the bag, on pads. Uh, if you have a good drilling partner, maybe, maybe 100%. But even then, like, what is 100%? <laughs> I mean, you go 100% intensity. Right. 100% focus, you know, but you can you go 100% power? No, you shouldn't be. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can go... You know, I, I when we Shark Tank people, I always say I want you to break the other person with um, with volume, and I want you to break them with cardio, and I want you to break them with pressure, but I don't need you to break them with power. Yeah. You know, and and, that, and that's true, dude, because I, I can break a guy with volume. I'm just overwhelming him. Mm-hmm. Like, everything's touching. It's not hurting him, but he, everything's touching. Yeah. You know, or I can, I can break a guy with just, like, overwhelming pressure. Where I'm just every moment he's he like you know Clay Guida used to say like I'm gonna make him feel like I just want him to to hate every moment that he's in the cage with me mm-hmm. you know so look at this all right uh, Rich final thoughts on sparring when you you have uh, 75 pages of notes <laughs> um, final thoughts you know again it's a it's a necessity um, for those who are looking to compete I think there's different times and places where you can go hard. Do a lot of sparring. Don't do sparring. Uh, at the end of the day, martial arts is about self mastery, right? Learning how to control yourself in these intense situations and overcoming them. So sometimes that means just taking steps back and do it slow, do it relaxed. Um, that's in the pursuit of self mastery. If you're always doing everything super hard and now you have a broken nose how are you going to practice self-mastery how are you going yeah. to deal with it when you have a torn acl you know those things are preventable so there's no need to go super hard and again brain injuries are real people stop joking about them um you know i i joke about them but at the end of the day we if you've been in martial arts long enough you know someone who has cte that's just the truth yeah. and hopefully it doesn't get bad to the point where you know they make a headline, but, uh, you know, like respect the sport the way it is. And th- there is a lot of damage that can be done. That's unseen. So yeah, you know, have that respect for it. Uh, I would, I'd agree with all of that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it goes, but I think this always goes back to culture. You know, you want to be in the gym. That's got a culture of like technical sparring that is working on mastery of tools and they're not there. There's no ego. They're not trying to prove a point. Like they're not trying to hurt you. Um, you know, sparring's complex. We could probably do another episode on this. And also, guys, if you're listening, you know, when, when you know, I posted on our all of our social media, like, questions. So if next time you see that, if you want one of your questions read, you know, feel free to put it in there. Um, we don't name names. We keep it anonymous. So, you know, whatever questions that you want, as long as they're not ridiculous, or maybe if they are, I don't know. Again, guys, thank you so much. This is our, uh, hopefully, weekly podcast, Combat Theory Presents. Uh, I was joined today by Coach Rich Grindle. And uh, that's me, Paul, signing off. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.